what was your favourite food over there, Chris? Where, 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 like China, Hong Kong or China? Well, I either, I've been in both. Um, what's my favourite food? I can tell you my worst food. Um, do you want to know that? Uh, let me guess. Is it going to be related to smelly fish? No. Well, maybe one of them was. Go on then. Dick. Dick. <laughs> dick. I had, I had a lot of dick. I ate a lot of dick. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, how are you, sir? Hello, mate. Very well. Thank you for having me on the podcast. I'm a big fan, Chris. Big fan of your show. Oh, well, it's that's um that's just an absolute honor to hear. I'm I'm always um I'm not really good at taking compliments because you know, I I just I just do stuff and that's <laughs> but I understand. But, yeah. But, it's funny, it's a, a lot of high achievers are the same. Can't take a compliment. Yeah, but but what I do know though is I love respect. So thank you for saying that. You're welcome, <laughs> um, very welcome. And and also let's be honest, if I'm trying to, you know, this podcast, I think any content provider will tell you, and I, and you 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 you've been you you are one yourself, and you've certainly been in the media a lot in your history, Chris. But any anyone will tell you, you know it all starts with a first move an idea a dream yeah. yeah put it into action you know i didn't have to start talking into that web in fact it wasn't even that webcam that's an expensive one the one i had before was this you know cheap one that they give you when you get your pc or whatever yes it all starts with an idea you start talking into that web camera when it's not breaking down like it just did and um and when people start to respond and say, Chris, I really like that video, it's it I guess that's a bit of a wow moment, isn't it? it and and then when you've got fifty thousand people who clearly like yep. videos, then then you think that's ten times bigger than our football stadium. That's that's ten times yep. more capacity than Plymouth Argyle. Yep. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Right. And yeah. And it's just nice. It's nice to um it's nice to do stuff that people appreciate. And of course, with what you've done in the martial arts, you, I mean, you must have experienced this very thing. I suppose, I suppose you're right, mate. Yeah, it's, uh, it's all, I, I know you, I think you've just hit like 50,000, haven't you? Which is massive for a podcast. Um, I, is, that, is that right, Chris? Yeah, 50,000. What it's is incredible. a bit more kind of spectacular or to my mind, I mean, Chris, is it's it's like when you're getting a million views a month, including yeah, right. all the, the downloads on the other plat. You know, uh, 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 that's that's a lot of people, isn't it? Yes, mate. It's it's, it's a lot of people. I mean, I, I I I I've watched your podcast. I like it. I think it's great. I think it's a real brand. Um, it's it's very clear and definite about what it is, Chris. And you're very clear about your message. You know get out there and venture like life's worth living. And I love that message that you put out. Um, you were saying about um, there's no such thing as a bad experience. I think that's really empowering, mate, to be honest. And I think that's really, really important for, for not just young men to hear, but um, all, all men really and, and, and women, of course, but I'm just talking from my own perspective. Um, people who get out there. Yeah, it's funny, Chris. My surname means slave, right? So the thrills. Right. We were actually Vikings. We were the lower caste of Vikings. So Viking had a caste system. The lowest caste was called the Thralls, right? So yeah. I put that in there so I can keep my warrior claim to fame, right? <laughs> we, we were Vikings, but we were slaves as well. But anyway, I don't know if it's anything to do with that. I doubt it. But, you know, I, I think we are all enslaved as we sit here now there are people trying to enslave us and i think they've done it my whole life right i think they're yeah, yeah i refer to them as sociopaths and i think ever since they worked out they could 
rig the 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 system of exchange so the money system um they worked out how they can control people and without going down that road because it's like it's not complicated but it takes a bit of explaining they know how to control people's left brain and keep them in the dark and so if we've been slaves all our lives we need to reject that system that system of thinking because that system of thinking has been put on us by people that don't care about us they only care about themselves they don't have a love of humanity that generally speaking human beings are kind of born with i i, I think you know yeah. why we complete strangers can have a wonderful chat now i don't want to bloody kill you or, or rob you chris I'm, I'm just not you know I might it's not that way. I might steal that skeleton, but <laughs> it's pretty good though, isn't it? To be fair, you can just see the lower half, can't you, in the frame? Look, I'll show you. I call him Bob. <laughs> Bob Hope. He's got no hope of coming back alive again. <laughs> so, so yeah. So it's very kind you say, but all, all I do is I challenge everything that we've been taught because it doesn't work. All it does is make you miserable. It gives you a false understanding of what the beauty of this life actually is. And yeah. we did a live chat we, we in our um, Patreon live, free life coaching that, that I do once a month. We had a Zoom chat the other night and we, we, um, we were just challenging these kind of things. We were looking at death and bereavement and how we're only taught one single narrative. And that is if someone dies, You've got to cry your eyes out and then just keep crying the rest of your life. And, you know, you'll never get over it. But in 20 years, you might feel a bit better. But that's not a good deal, is it? You know, because we're all we're all going to lose people that we love. You need a better way of dealing with it than being depressed for 20 years. You just need a better way. And very often, I think this depress this depressive kind of structure we frame death with comes from the fact that it's this system of control we've been subjected to that doesn't care about us. And, and, and it, it, it just adds to the fear that, Oh my God, I don't want someone to die because I can't have, you know, like, and it's just, it's a fear based society that we live in and gone on a little bit long winded considering this is your podcast, Chris, but it's, no, it's, no, no, no. it's, it's a valid, you know, I think it's a valid subject for all of us. We need yeah. to ditch the old rules. They don't work. We need to start, you know, moving into the light, so to speak. So, but I mean, you're, you're here crediting me. I've just been listening to your work on Buddhism. What yeah. is it the Buddha said? He said, you know, you fight anger with happiness. You fight. Yeah. You fight it's all about transmuting isn't it it's like about transmuting emotions chris you know um I, I, and that was what attracted me to it very much um <clears throat> i think i think essentially uh buddhism and the study of it is about it's about helping people find their place in the world i don't think it's about telling people what to do or what to believe in fact my buddhist teacher first thing he said to me is don't believe a word i say he says, run it through your own common sense first. If it makes sense to you, then investigate it, but don't just believe it because I'm saying it. Um, and, I, and I thought that was like really profound. You know, he said, get it off the paper, go and, go and live it, go and experience it. And um, so it's certainly been a source of comfort and help through, for me through my life. And it's definitely changed the way I do things, look at things and act and react and then it kind of matures over the years and I'm not trying to say I'm anything special, but it, it, you know, the more you study and the more you practice it and think about it, um, it does kind of start to become what I thought was a better framework for living your life. You know? Yes. So there'll be many people listening probably don't really know what Buddhism is. I mean, I, I only know because I've spent time in the far East um mm. I'm, I'm not saying you have to spend time in the far east to understand yeah. what buddhism is but for me i i had to and it yeah. was very simple things like my um my sister-in-law was thai yeah um is or is thai i should say and um to see 
her attitude towards things, which is completely different from from ours. So, for example, acceptance, you know, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. accepting all, all all people and all difference. That that was a sort of eye opener. Um, I was wandering through Singapore one day, Chris, and we we got to a, a Buddhist temple. I've actually, funny enough, I put the photo of it on my Instagram today. If any, anyone's oh, okay. listening, it's it's this. Yeah. Um, I don't even know if it's a Buddhist statue. It might even be 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 hit be, be hi, hi, Hindi. It's like this cat looking per. I I can't even remember to be honest. But anyway, so I'm walking past this temple with a local Singaporean, and he started to you know do some sort of like prayer ritual uh, out of respect, and and he turned to me and said, uh, Ah, Chris, what religion? And I said, I don't have one. He went, ah, free thinker, right? <laughs> and, and I thought, you know what? Yeah. You've just hit the net. That is exactly what I, I, I don't want to be slept. I, I, my family, we, we came out, we fought our way out of slavery, the thralls did, right? I don't want to go back there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so... But but again, this very accepting, you know, there's him. He's doing his, you know, but when yeah. I said, no, I don't do any of that. He's like, oh, wow. He just had great respect for me. And yeah, yeah. And yeah, I think in that sense, Chris, it's more like a philosophy than a religion. I think it should be. I think it really is actually a philosophy rather than a religion. So it's like take, you know, you, you don't have to like worship. And in fact, in Zen, there's a saying, which is a, like a it's actually a Chinese that eventually became Japanese version of Buddhism. But there's a saying that says something like this, Chris, there's 10,000 uh, statues of the Buddha in the world. Each single one will be a hindrance to you understanding what Buddhism is about. So it's saying, don't, don't worship eff effigies, you know, don't worship things, don't do that. Just think, you know, just think, calm yourself down, meditate, understand your own mind a little bit better. Um, and that, you know, and there's a bit of direction and guidance. There's no, you know, uh, there's no commandments, if you like. There's no, you must do this, you mustn't do that. There's, there's, they say there's ways to live your life better, that are better for you, that create a better life for you. And certainly it created a better life for me. Um, but there's no sort of, you know, it's not hard and fast. They don't shove it down your throat. And there's, you know, I think it's quite a peaceful, t tolerant uh, philosophy, really, actually. Yeah. It's interesting, Chris, isn't it? Because I think anybody that's, gone down the path to enlightenment has followed the buddha's story and we'll, we'll i'll let you explain to people what 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 he was a prince wasn't he and and he and yeah but when i look at my life in fact can you tell us about was it prince siddhartha was that his name siddhartha yeah so basically um sort of to just uh, i should sort of paraphrase roughly the story is that um he was a prince and um, his father wanted him to become a king. Um, and he left the palace, I forget what age it was, maybe 25 or something like that. He left out the palace and prior to him going outside of the palace, he'd never seen death or old age. As the story goes, he'd just been completely showered with like every luxury you can imagine. And then he came out and he saw in the streets, um, old people like dying, sick and poor, and he was like, oh, what's this? You know, can you imagine, can you imagine the privilege, you know, having never seen anybody old or poor. Um, and he was shocked by it. And then he, he, um, he wanted to try and understand it. So he went, he went and studied in the forest and studied with like wise men and, you know, starved himself and meditated for extended periods of time until he um, came up with a, a formula of understanding about the cycle of life and death, basically. And um, again, to cut a long story short, because you could talk about this for, for, for years really, but he, he said, um, right, um, life contains lots of suffering that we don't understand. So there's the suffering of age, so suffering, there's the suffering of being born. In fact, there's a lot of suffering when someone gives birth and when you're born, uh, the suffering of age and the suffering of like actually acquiring material goods and being separated from them. So you acquire things, you get attached to them. Like my master said to me, well, imagine you buy 
a yacht is that a good thing i was like wow a yacht wow that's an amazing thing and he said but what about when you're not with it are you worried that someone might steal it or it might rot or get damaged well yeah yeah of course well that's the kind of suffering so he, he talks about like he talks about the the subtle sufferings in the things that we think are um not suffering right um and then and then he talks as well about understanding that as a way to set you free and when you understand your suffering um the sort of little bits that you deny in your mind you 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 change the way that you act and then you change the way just naturally you don't have to force it you then change the way you act towards other people because like in your life chris you've had a lot of suffering you've had a lot of hard times and i'm sure that built a lot of empathy in you to understand other people's difficult times and so i think i'm not i mean i, I didn't actually know we were going to talk about buddhism i mean i thought i'd, I'd have read read a few more books and like come up with some clever words to try and impress you but i think essentially it's, it's talking about just understanding being empathetic and kind but not from a place of where you have to be coming from a place of like just understanding yourself and then trying to understand other people so that's i think essentially what it what it is that you know well perhaps for our friends at home chris i'll i'll relate it to my story and this is this is a fascinating philosophical question that we were discussing again the other night in our live coaching is because we talk when we're live coaching we we talk in terms of the people that live in the matrix and those, those of us that don't sorry if people find that rude it's just you know we're in challenging times and I just believe in speaking straight and and I used to live in the matrix you know I but but the question we posed is in order to step out of the matrix uh, which which I refer to as setting foot down the path of enlightenment or even indeed being enlightened does it require a traumatic experience maybe even a traumatic childhood experience is the requisite you know not to say you can't become understanding or some people aren't just generally yeah. nice nice people da, 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 but to actually see the truth in life which many people find really hard i know people they're not in the that they've got like they've stepped out the matrix with one foot Mm. they're in this brave new world no no pun intended um or no reference intended um they're realizing ah that old world yeah it's not it, it that shit doesn't work right yeah but in order to try to make sense of this new world a aka enlightenment they're using the old school rules right mm -hmm. so they'll say you know we gotta fix the planet we gotta fix it we need to vote in this guy and it's like no no <laughs> you can't fix a corrupt system using the same corrupt system it's not really sense you know um yeah it's a bit yeah like, it's, it's, well, it's so hard though isn't it because the system's so all-encompassing and it's so big and it supports everything that you've been told from year dot i mean it's a bit like a kid realizing that father christmas doesn't exist isn't it Yes. It's like, I mean, wait, Father Christmas doesn't exist. I've been lied to. What? Um, but then you still carry on giving presents and you still perpetuate the same, you know, I would say lie, it's a harsh word for you, for your own kids, mm. you know, to keep them in the system. Can you imagine, like, um, you, we, you've got kids, I've got kids. Can you imagine your kid, when they're five year old, you're going to, there's no Father Christmas and I want you to go tell your mates, it's all a big lie and um, I'm not buying you anything for Christmas. They go to school, they tell their mates that. And they're like, what the hell? Everyone's <laughs> everyone like you almost do it just to keep fitting in with everybody else. You know, you have to. The system is designed so that um, you know, it, it keeps you in, it keeps you in. Yeah. Um, and you have to have some degree of you have to have some degree of like you have to have you have to kind of have one foot in it to survive, you know, to to pay the electric bills or whatever. I'm I, I'm I'm on the same page as you, mate. I I like. I've I've long thought that we are you know we're like slaves building pyramids really um, you know the big banking system and everything it's like you don't own your house mate you what you do is 
you go out and you slave for somebody else so that you can pay the slave master so you can rent that thing that in 25 years you say is yours um, yeah. and and then woe betide anyone who drops out of that system even when it's yours when you die then your kids or whoever you leave your property then have to pay a third of it to the sociopaths you know <laughs> it is funny though it's isn't a it? perfect system isn't it chris if you're in charge mm. you know yeah you know i said i sat down with my, my girlfriend last night chris and i just said you know, I know people that talk the talk. They say all the right stuff, all the kind of enlightenment, right? But Chris, I know they still live in the matrix, right? Mm. I know that in their heart hearts, they they still cling to the notion that three guys got in a tin can, chucked some fossil fuel in the bottom of it, and went went to another planet. That that, and this isn't about whether they did or not. This is about like having the ability to rationalize and, and actually apply logic to a scenario and go, do you know what? I'm, I can actually question this. I could pull some holes in this, you know, I'm, I'm never going to know the answer perhaps, but I can, you know, that, that's what I, I kind of feel is enlightenment is, is knowing that there's never like an absolute truth. Um, or maybe there are, there's some, maybe there are some absolute truth. Sorry, a bit contradictory, but that's all right. Going what what do you think about Elon Musk's like going to Mars then, Chris? Is that what, what's that all about? This is where it gets confusing, right? Because just when I would have said, oh, he's one of the, you know, he's a puppet for the sociopaths, right? And I'll explain, I, I, I'll, I'll explain why. He then comes out and starts attacking Bill Gates over, let's not say the, the buzzwords, Chris, because we'll get deplatformed, but yeah, what I mean is it's just a difficult area to go in. But, you know, yeah. what, what Bill Gates' plans for the world are, Elon right. Musk has come out and gone, the guy's a knob. I ain't doing that to me or my family, right? <laughs> so just when you think all these Silicon Valley, Muppet, Puppet, autocratic, technocratic, corporate um, mentalists are all in the same boat with their secret Bilderberg meetings, then you see two of them come out in public and argue. But... You could say there, yeah, that's the whole idea, Chris. The two big names arguing takes the the you know the takes you away from the real truth in life, from or discovering the real truth. Arguing. So to go back to your question, um, when anyone discusses going to another planet, as if like we've already done that, that their credibility to me just like either they know they're lying and they, you know, they, and which is the case with all these SpaceX stuff. Yeah. They're not stupid. They, they, they know we haven't been to the moon, right? It's a, phys it, it's, we don't even really understand that the vastness of space or, or, or the effect that it has on us as, you know, as, as a human being. Right. So, so in all honesty, like if you had to bet your life on it, right. My bet would be, we hadn't. Right. Right. Okay. That and just, yeah <laughs> sorry it's a funny it's a funny topic but he, here's the thing right elon musk sent his two um he sent his rocket into space right his spacex one and the famous thing about it or his novel thing is that the the burners the boosters the rockets come back down to earth so they deliver their payload up in the sky, which will be, you know, a satellite. And yes, I, I, I believe there are satellites because you sit on a beach in Africa with no light pollution, you see them going over, right? So yeah. I don't, yeah. I, I think there's satellites. I think that obviously to get the satellite up there, they've probably been put up there with a, with a rocket. And yeah, you know, unless I'm a bit deluded, maybe you can put a hot, a, a balloon on them yeah, or something, like and, satellite. you know, but I think when, you know, that when you get the tra trajectory right and you're at that balance, that cusp of, you know, depending where you are in the atmosphere will dictate how much gravitational pull is affected on that object towards the centre of the Earth, right? So mm. the lower you are in that atmosphere, the more thrust, the more you have mm. to chuck that satellite out to keep it then 
orbiting right literally it's like that isn't it it's like a it's almost like a like a, a double boomerang effect right the higher it is less gravitational pull because as we know there's less gravity as you go up into space yeah. then you just got to tap that satellite gently and it's just trajectory is going to go into orbit you know begin orbiting the earth because it's basically trying to fall but as it falls the combination of gravity versus thrust or movement keeps it in 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 this orbit right so like i get that what i don't get is that when these two rocket boosters were coming back down to earth and they're going to land on these two ships out in the ocean which you know let's be honest there's pretty much an amazing feat of technology that, that <laughs> one minute they're in outer space or we know it's not yeah, out. Yeah. They, they always that work? Them. Yeah. How's that work? How's it going to land on a ship? Yeah, well, this is the thing, right? But With waves and the sea and... This, this is how... This is where it becomes interesting. So he's got the cameras on each rocket booster, right? Right. And as they're coming down to their, their docks, their landing pads which are on these rafts out at sea or these ships, whatever they are, right? What he hasn't realised, or what SpaceX haven't realised, is the camera on this booster is putting out the exact same TV image as the one on this one. It's just, it's like, for argument's sake, three seconds behind. So on this one, you see it, it, it travelling towards the ship and maybe there's a judder, on this one, it's traveling towards the ship. One, two, three. And then there, there's there's the judder. It's the same camera, right? Now, that isn't the, the, the smoking gun in itself. The smoking gun is that when this was pointed out on YouTube, that, dude, it's like you got the same camera on separate rockets. It's, you know, what are you, what are you trying to pull here, right? What happened is the next day it changed. And the video change. So the camera on this booster was genuinely a different place and location to the one on this, right? Coming down on separate sheet. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't you couldn't argue that the, the picture yeah, you could good. argue, you could argue if it's all CGI or something, right? But well, as you know, Chris, as a content pr creator on YouTube, as I am. You can go into a video on YouTube and edit a bit out. So if I say the F word now, I go, oh, do you know what, Chris? I'm going to edit that out. I'll, I'll, once this is uploaded to YouTube or, you know, if I, if I upload this video to YouTube and then I remember, oh, my God, I swore I want to take that out. Right. Not not that I would because I swear a lot. <laughs> I can see it. Right? Sorry, Chris, I, yeah, I, I can snip that out, can't I? Right. It's yeah. called the YouTube Creator Studio. But what I cannot do, Chris, is re-upload a new video and keep the same the keep the same views, the likes, the comments, and all of that. Right. You can't do that. You cannot upload a new if you upload a new video, it's got to be completely fresh. Starts again, yeah. Right. Yeah. So my question is: if you ask me what do I think of SpaceX, how did they how why did YouTube allow them to re-upload this video? when you and I couldn't do it, right? Okay, we're not corporate sociopaths, but... Yeah, yeah. they're all mates. So that's that. All this nonsense about going to Mars, it's just to get... Fun if you ask me, I think it's just to get funding. It's just to keep getting... It's an excuse for corporate billionaires to off offshoot some of their tax losses by giving it to SpaceX or whatever. Um there's another company, I'm not going to say the name, but let's be honest, they've been getting billions every year from the, the great uh, US public to put on this um, <clears throat> show, you know. Um, maybe it got to the point where they needed to kind of disseminate that focus on, on, a, on a one single company because the, the, the fraud is so huge, right? so they kind of privatized it now so they you've got all these companies coming up with professing to put rockets on mars not not just the one like the old days yeah. And, yeah. and and it's it's easier to perpetuate 
you know, the, to perpetuate the myth that like it's possible to go to Mars in the next like 20 years. It's, um, gosh, we've really gone off topic, haven't we? <laughs> No, Just not bit, not though. that there's not that there's a topic, and that's what I love about podcasting. But I am uh, I am conscious you're 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 my guest. So so no, don't be sorry. You, you said it was like a chat in a pub. You messaged me. You just ah, oh, Chris, it's like a chat in a pub. Two blokes. Yeah, well, there you go. Like, yeah, that's great. Yeah, know. it's just the problem is, Chris. A lot of people haven't caught up with podcasts, and they're still very old school. And you know they'll write. They'll, they'll write to me and go, Chris, you, you like kept talking. And it's like, yeah, that's like what I would do with my mate in the pub. We like, he says a bit, yeah. I, I say a bit. Yeah, it's a conversation. So going back to the Buddhist story, like it, 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 it's a very traditional story. You could almost liken it to the hero story. So, you you Mm -hmm. know, your Prince Charming story that's used in pretty much like every kind of Hollywood film, Mm -hmm. isn't it? Because you take my situation again, I'll just use myself as an example. Um, He, this young prince looked out the palace for the first time. He saw dead bodies, aging people, disabled people, and extreme poverty and nastiness, the likes of which he'd never experienced. A traumatic moment for him, right? Yeah. As a child, traumatic moment, right? My life, lots of fairly traumatic moments, if I was honest, stuff that a child shouldn't really, I'd say in an ideal scenario, shouldn't really be trying to make sense of at that age, right? As such as I grew up, something in your head is ill at ease you know you you don't have this calmness in yourself that possibly other people that haven't been through trauma do as such you need answers because you want to know why do i feel different why do i seem to struggle with life or or you know why is it like all the kids at school pass their exams first time or it seemed that way and I, I like failed everything, you know, what, what, why, why? And in an effort to answer that question, you experiment. So for me, my first big experiment was going in the military. You know, this was the thing that was going to make me because mm. when I get that 250 quid a week, you know, left brain thinking here, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll be happy. In fact, it wasn't even, it was like 120 quid m- first month, sa- first week salary, I think in the Marines. But you know, when I get that, when I get a green berry on my head, I'll, I will be someone, right? And you get there and then you realize, no, nah, I'm like actually just exactly the same, you know, I'm obsessively mm-hmm. do it. So then I obsessively started bodybuilding, right? That, that's going to, you know, when I got the big muscles, the girls will want to kiss me and that, yeah, I'll be there, you know. Then step one, step down the road, become the, the substance use, you know, right. Oh, this thing makes me feel great. Oh, there's my answer. Right. I'll follow this. I'll jump on this donkey for a while. You know, this is going to sort me out. Right. I mean, you know, and, and so Oh, and then it it was business, wasn't it? Uh, You know, big business. I went to Hong Kong. We're going to chat about that. I've I've got this, you know, the the cliche million dollar business I've created, right? Um, Or the projected forecast, I should say. And Mm. that's going to make me happy. Because when I've got my Porsche 911, you know, and I I clean it on a Sunday morning outside the, the front of my house, which has got a swimming pool, then I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna be this this fucking happy guy, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, that's it, right? So I'm gonna make it in business, you know. And then and then I'm just gonna bomb burst a million different things, experimenting with diet, finding out about your body's alkalinity, the most single important thing anybody can do, your pH balance. Um uh doing like reading martial arts books, right? Do, doing, a, you know, a little bit, le- learning a bit there, working for a criminal gang, AKA the 14K, the Hong, the Hong Kong tribe, seeing that side of life, 
getting so ill on drugs that I'm mentally unwell. So I'm seeing that side of life that no, nobody sees, right? Coming back, living in abject or at, at least, well, abject poverty for, for 18 months, chronically depressed, you know, living in squalor, literally starving most of the time, you know, so much so when I got food, I would eat it like a dog. Like I, I couldn't get it into my body fast enough, right? I still do that, Chris. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> Off the back of that, right? <laughs> Off the back of that criminality, I've been involved in crime thinking, well, if I can steal this amount of money, then I'll I'll be happy, yeah. you know? Maybe I could steal yeah. that, get a house or something, right? Um, um, so criminality. Then it was edu higher, uh, travel. Right, if I travel to 87... 87 countries on all seven continents, and I become a pilot, skydiver, Antarctic explorer, author, uh, da, 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 on the way, then I'll be happy, won't I? That, 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 right? Then it's like, uh, oh no, God, God, if I work with street children in Mozambique, and then I drive a bus to India and back, and we write about articles in poverty, then, you know, so what am I getting to? Oh, then higher education, right? So getting a degree in the social sciences. So I, I, I studied youth work and then social work. So I learned the biology, the psychology, the sociology, um, and, you know, the, the, the theoretical uh, uh, the theoretical case and the philosophical arguments, right? And then that. And then, of course, I'm reading all my life. I'm reading, reading, reading. Re 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 I'm getting to the point that was I not just doing exactly what that Prince Siddhartha did? I'd realised from a young age, life ain't right. You know, I'm, I'm going through stuff that I shouldn't really. I'm then grown up wanting to answer that question, why? And I put my fingers and my toes in every single pie that I ever could in the quest for that answer. And finally, I arrived back at the same place, a.k.a. Chris Thrall. Then I realised it's actually not a place. It's part of something called the universe. And I'm actually insignificant and I'm completely unimportant. And the only importance I could possibly attach to myself is that which I socially construct in my head, you know, with that which I psychologically construct in my head. Um, I'm literally the ashes to ashes, dust to dust, nothing more. But what I am is I'm the universe. Primarily, I'm a part of the universe in the same way seaweed is part of the seabed, you know, it, it, it or it's probably a bad analogy, the same way that rock is part of the planet, you know, magma rock, it's, it's just a part of the planet. It's not a rock, you don't go, hey, that rock's called Dave. All right, Dave, how's the Porsche 911? <laughs> you haven't got a Porsche 911 yet, Dave. All oh, right, okay. Been to Hong Kong. Right. Oh, you want to do that? You want to learn? You know, it, it, this this is as kind of ludicrous as it gets. So there's a there's a saying in Taoism, uh, a, a, an analogy that springs to mind. It's like uh, a drop. Like you think of a wave on the sea as the waves going forward, and you know you gets gets the the top bit, the white bit, the crest of the wave, and then on the crest of the wave, there's little drops of water that come off the off the wave, and they come off the wave for a little while. And while they're separate from the wave, they say, hey, I'm separate from the wave. I am a drop of water. I am all alone. Mm. But then give it a few seconds and they join back with the ocean and they become part of that wave again. So that reminds me of, of that, Chris, for a brief moment, we think that we're separate from the universe. And then we, while we're separate, we think, well, I'll do this. I'll do that. I've got to do that. I've got to find out who I am all the time, not knowing that they're actually part of the wave. And not knowing that there isn't anything to, it, it's crazy. You have to, I've had to travel the planet and do every single mental stuff that I possibly can to realize that I actually didn't need to do any of that. And that peace is in my head and that I am, like I say, I mean, insignificant. And I mean that in a good way, you know, mm. I don't have to attach any bloody importance to myself. You know, I don't have to achieve any, all I've got to do is just maintain some kind of equilibrium in my life and, and open my eyes and appreciate it and do a few crazy stuff because after all we're life experience in itself so why not throw yourself out of airplanes if if that floats your boat but um 
Yes, so there we have it, folks. That was a clip that I wanted to put out about Buddhism. I'm just going to write that down, and I, I, I think we did very well. Let, let's go back to your history, Chris. Where did Hong Kong come into it? Um, I guess I was about 17 uh, years old, 17, 18, when I went out there. Uh, oh. I've been doing martial arts a long time, yeah. On, yeah, I, I, I thought for some reason you'd grown up a lot younger. Can you tell us where your surname comes from? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm half Irish, half Italian. So my father's Italian, uh, mother's Irish. Uh, so that's my, my background. I didn't grow up with my father, I grew up with my mother. And life wasn't easy as a kid. Um, as a teenager, we had a... a well, no, I wasn't a teenager. I don't know how old I was, maybe 11 or 12 or something. We had a break in. It was fucking horrible. Um, you know, and it was like petrol burn the house down kind of kind of gig. It wasn't pleasant. And that's the first time I experienced the feeling of, oh, fuck, I'm going to die here. I really did think, I really did believe that. And, um, you know, that where you where you think, oh, I'm helpless, I can't do nothing. That's it. Then that's my number, is it? That That's it. There's like that terminalness to it. And that scared me so much, Chris. It really did. It really affected me. And a um, couple of weeks later, a friend of mine says, come down and do some Kung Fu. And I was like, that's a load of bollocks, isn't it? I'd done a bit as a kid because my family were involved in it. Um, and I was like, oh, I'm, not sure. I'm not interested. Anyway, they dragged, cut a long story short, they dragged me down there, started doing the Kung Fu. Um, and just kind of obsessed with it, really. Um, so... I really took it to heart and it gave me that structure that I wanted, probably something similar to what you found in the military in terms of like regular training, discipline, self-respect. Um, there's a kind of an order and a ranking system. And the more you work, the better you get and the higher you climb and the better you become within that organisation. So I did quite I did quite well just because I worked so hard. I didn't really have anything else going on. It wasn't the internet then, was it? And... Uh, from there, I went to, um, I was just started going around all different schools. As a I wasn't very good at school, I was dyslexic. Um, got a high IQ, but not very good at school. Um, started traveling around all the different schools, getting on the bus and going and trying this school, that school, the other school. Ended up in a Chinese community center um, and kind of got taken in really and taken under their wing. Um, trained there for a good few years and um, then went off to Hong Kong when I was about 17. That's where I got involved in Buddhism, by the way. Mm -hmm. So the guys at the, at the, um, at the, the Chinese community center would, were dabbling in things that they probably shouldn't have been. Um, and I know that you, you, you know about that sort of stuff. And um, a lot of them went to jail uh, for very long stretches. We're talking, and, um, again, we're talking the organized crime thing as opposed to the drug thing now, right? Yeah, yeah, no drugs, yeah, no drugs. Um, and um, so what ended up happening was, I, again, I was left without anything to do really and without that family structure and, and, and that was a driver for me very much. So I thought, right, well, you know, I picked up a little bit of Cantonese, a few words by then. I was the only white kid training in, in, that, in that community. And um, I went off to Hong Kong and uh, went out there to find some Kung Fu and to carry on training and find another sort of structure for myself, really. And uh, I came across a Buddhist monk. And I'll never forget, I, I had, had a chat with this guy. He was sitting in there in his orange robes and stuff. I was a 17 year old kid from Birmingham, um, you know, quite rebellious really as a, as a youth. Um, and I said to him, excuse me, mate, can I have a word? And he spoke English, he said, yeah, yeah. I said, what's, what's with the whole, you know, like, wearing an orange sheet, um, no disrespect, but what was it all about? And he said, he said, I'm a Buddhist. He said, what well, was that? And he said, well, he said, Buddhism is like, if you think about it like this, he goes, you know, on a tree, you've got leaves, right? And he goes, the leaves at the certain time of the year, they fall down to the ground, don't they? I was like, yeah. And he said, well, when the leaf falls down, the wind blows it from the left to the right on the way down. I'm like, mm, okay, it's, well, Buddhism is about learning how to not be so affected by the winds on the way down. So what he was saying, Chris, is um, 
the practice of Buddhism, not the religion, but the practice of the philosophy, like the understanding, the meditation, the study, you know, he says that helps you not, you, you, you're born into the world, you're that leaf, you get dropped into the world and you're going to die, you're going to go back to the earth, right? You are that leaf. The wind blows you left and right. The sufferings, the different kind of suffering that you encounter in life, the different, you know, the different things that you do that cause suffering. And he said, so the study of Buddhism helps you not to be so affected by the winds of suffering on your journey. So you can travel in a more direct light, uh, direct uh, path. So that was what that, so I went to, Hong long story short, so I, I, I went to Hong Kong and then I was quite taken by that. And I was like, wow, that really makes sense. And I think that's kind of what I'm looking for. So I started studying that as well as the Kung Fu out there in Hong Kong. And I found a great teacher who was a really positive human being. He was a good man. He was a member of um, the community. You know, in fact, his dad was knight, um, not knighted, he got a CBE or something from the Queen. But they, they were a good, a, a good organization, very positive, and they worked with youth uh, in Hong Kong. And that was that was a, 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 a change of um, environment for me, Chris. And um, the Buddhism got me into reading more and studying more. Um, and then I eventually, eventually sort of came back and went to, to university um, and did a, a, a degree in, in Chinese in London and over in, in Beijing as well. Beijing, yeah. So kind of led me in a different path. I don't know if our friends at home can see that one. That I believe that's the Buddha, isn't it? That it's the Buddha, and then when you turn it, it goes to Guan Yin, yeah. Is that the prince or is it? I don't know what that. No, so basically the first one is a is a Buddha in there. <laughs> that's brilliant. I've got to get one of those. Is that like a fridge magnet or something? I, I'm going to explain <laughs> it because what you've just said made me, I've just got it out of my wallet, but but go on. So Guan, Guan Yin is the goddess of compassion. So she's popular in Hong, Hong Kong. You'll see a lot of Guan Yin. Do you get in Hong Kong? Have I just given myself bad, bad luck because I thought she was a bloke? No, no, she wasn't <laughs> listening. In fact, there is was some story. I, no, no, uh, Chris, there is some story that 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 um, I don't know what you call it, saint or something like that in English, I suppose. I think she was a man, but then turned into a woman because she had so much uh, compassion oh, for. I was a little some, bit right then. There. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I um. And I want to let's let's go back and talk more about Hong Kong because that fascinates me that we've trod the same, you know, we've trodden the same street. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I was just I think I just got off the um, Star Ferry and was make, wait, making my way into Kowloon. Yeah. And one of the Orange Road said Orange Road monks came up and I, do they go like like that or some, something? And and. I've got this stage in my life where sometimes I just can't be asked to say, no, I don't want to give you my money. So I just went, all right, how much do you want? And he went, so I gave him a hundred Hong Kong dollars as well. It was about a tenner, isn't it? Tenner, and, yeah. And then he went and he gave me this and he, he gave me this little flippy thing of the Buddha and this, um, this man girl. <laughs> and, uh, and ever since this was 2011 so for 11 years i've carried that in my wallet um for good luck i'm not saying i'm massively superstitious but i thought why not i'll i'll keep that for good luck and my my dreams will continue to keep coming true and of course they they have but so 17 years old in Hong Kong, I was 25, so a bit older than you when I got there. What year were you there? Oh, let me see. Uh, 90, I guess it was probably nine, early 90, maybe 1991, something like that. Oh, so you I there guess, before yeah. me. Yeah, I guess, yeah. And which area did you live in? So I lived all over. Um, initially, I was in Kowloon because that's where the school was. Um, and then I, I went up to, um, I started, I'd run out of money, basically. So I started living on, um, over in the west side um, on Mount St. Davis, which is, they had like a youth hostel on the top of the mountain there. And it was like two quid a night or something. You could stay there for. So I was over there for a few months. Do you know that place? No, Fantastic. I'm just, uh, I wish I could have found a place for two quid a night when I was I know, home, mate, homeless. I know, because it's really dear isn't it it's really oh, expensive 
It was a schlep though, I have to say, because I'd have to get up at like four o'clock in the morning. It was about an hour down, it took me about an hour and a half to walk up. And then you'd have to walk down to the town, get a tram and then get a bus. It would take me like three hours to get to my teacher's school. So, and then of course there's no food up there. There was hardly any electricity actually. So you come up at the night, end of the night, you're walking up for the mountain at night time, it's pitch black for an hour. And um, if you go, oh, sh- I haven't got any food, I didn't bring any food. Just walk back down to the 7-Eleven. It's like an hour and a half down to get a pack of noodles, you know. So, it, 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 but I'll tell you what, it's one of the best times of my life. It's really, really happy up there. It was really fantastic. So I was there for a while. Then I've lived back a few different places as well. I've learned, lived over in uh, Chenzhou in the island, the island, one of the islands. Um, yeah. So, yeah, all over, really. How many years did you stay there? In Hong Kong. Mm. Hong Kong, uh, all together. Like probably if you added it all up, probably a couple of years. Yeah. Um, because I went there after uni as well. I started working out there. Did you get while. did you get into Wan Chai much, into the nightclubs? I, I didn't actually, to be honest. Um, but um I, I do know of the area. I might have been there once or twice. Um I know it was kind of I was more like to be honest with you, I wasn't really into the I wasn't really mixing with the expat community, and I know a lot of the expats spent a lot of time there, um as you did. But it wasn't really a like if you've got to get up at four in the morning, man, you can't really go nightclubbing, you know. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. do what I did, just you just stay up all night. There is that. <laughs> for, for nine nine days on end. And uh, actually, no, don't do that. <laughs> Doesn't have a good, great result. Yes. Yeah. It's got a very bad reputation, hasn't it, one chai? You know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of trouble there, although it certainly was, you know, um, back when when we were there yeah it was just it was interesting i i had two different hong kong experiences the very first time i ever went there which was i was there for like a two-week holiday i just didn't get under the skin at all i was wandering these big streets and to be completely honest i couldn't have told you whether i was on the island hong kong hong kong island or whether i was a mile away across the sea on the mainland because the 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 under in fact i didn't even use the underground system because i didn't know they had one right or i i I was i was a young traveler so i i just thought you got buses and taxis to places right so everywhere i went i just jumped in a cab and i went under the harbor tunnel blah 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 but a lot of the time i was realizing i don't actually know which part of this crazy huge yeah vibrant yeah. metropolis am i in now well, and chris it was a different time scale wasn't it mate because you know they didn't have you didn't have google maps and you didn't have like the internet to read or oh, where am i now and where's a restaurant mate i didn't even know what a guidebook was when i went out there first did you it's like no, you, get a no. in Kong. you just land don't you and try and sort it out when you're on the ground mm-hmm. and so it's a very different time frame yeah it's interesting you say I didn't know that there were travel guidebooks until I started traveling in the Americas about, mm. I don't know, let's just say 10 years later. Mm. So I'd rock up in a place, whether it's Hong Kong, China, Macau, you know, mm. Thailand. And I just say to the taxi driver, well, just take me to the, to the, where's the bar area? Where can I get? Yeah, where's, where's yeah. it happening? I have my little backpack on and that's it. They go, no, no, you you need a hotel. No, I don't. Oh, right. I want a beer. Take me, where Where can I get a beer? And and that was kind of like my traveling. But of course, I missed out uh, on all the touristy sort of things because I didn't know there were books that told you where all this stuff is. So my first time in Hong Kong, I just, I didn't get it. I, I, I actually started to get bored. It was so tiring walking everywhere. Yo, in that eight as well. I, I couldn't. I would go in a restaurant, look at a menu, all in Cantonese or in in in, in Chinese hieroglyphics, yeah. and I just I wouldn't know what to order. So I'd walk out again, and I'd go in McDonald's. So for two weeks in Hong Kong, should be a food paradise. I'm I'm eating you know bloody breakfast burgers or whatever the thing you know the egg the the egg McMuffin or whatever and. They are good over there, though, and they sell lemon tea as well in the McDonald's. Well, that's the thing about Hong Kong, isn't it? That it has such a huge competition with Cantonese cuisine, which is the 
Yeah. One ne probably next to Thailand, the best cuisine in the world, if you ask me. Yeah. But McDonald's has to be cheap so you can get a yeah, that's right. When I was there, you got a whole McDonald's for a quid, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Because not... they were really trying to push it, weren't they, to really try and get into the market to compete with the Cantonese food. And the Cantonese, like the eating habits are really strong in their culture. Mm. Yeah, they, yeah it's, it, it's a shame they couldn't have just said that to the big junk food places. But so fast forward to when I actually lived there, which was the third, my third time in Hong Kong. And I first saw that there's an MTR, so there's an underground, yeah. the, the mo yeah. motor transport railway or whatever, motor transit railway. And it can get you anywhere in Hong Kong, island or mainland within 20 minutes right maybe yeah. maybe 40 minutes for the northern territories and that it was relatively cheap mm -hmm. uh, my business partner took me out for exotic dim sum and, and all the rest of it um then you start learning about the street side restaurants and the noodles and you know you learn how to ask for your favorite dish and get a beer with it and this kind of thing and then the more I got into the crystal meth, the more inquisitive just to learn much more. So I wanted to know about the triads. So I wanted to know about this, the hand signs that they used. I wanted to, you know, know about the tattoos. I'd go bodybuilding in the gym and they'd, I'd be surrounded by these big, you know, gangsters with all these dragon tattoos and stuff and i just found it fascinating then i started to go down the alleyways the back alleys and the the back streets and i'd find marketplaces i didn't know existed i got friendly with lots of filipinas there the the um the girls in the, the service industry so the the cleaning and the the nannying and this sort of stuff and they take me to a market and i'd watch a guy peeling snakes you know, while they're still alive and then dropping them back in this creel. Watch, mm. watch. It was just insane. Then I'd wander into one chai market and see a guy smashing these cages with a stick. And I'm, what, what is this? What is this? Some guy in a crowd would go, um, he's saying this five, five step snake, this snake bite to you. You don't take more than five step. <laughs> Sorry, I do the accent, but I'm not yeah. saying to be patronised and yeah, doing yeah. it because this is yeah, Hong yeah. Kong, man. This fucking yeah, Hong Kong. It's, intense, it, it? it's yeah, just it's a, such a blast, you know. Um, mm. And on top of that, the first time I was there, I was in Lan Kwai Fong when the mass crush and 21 people got crushed to death. I think it was 11 people, 21 got crushed, crushed yep. to death in yeah. the street out one of the streets. I was in Hong Kong too that time, yeah. Yeah. Um, was it New Year's, was it, or something? Yeah, New Year, New Year crash, yeah, right. right? Yeah, I remember, me, yeah. Me, me and this Matlow, we just wandered right down that street with all these dead people dying and shoes and ambulances. And uh, I was also on the street when Yit Kai Fun went on one of his ramp, the, the, the famous armed robber went on one of his uh, AK-47 rampages and was was and shot a woman dead, in, 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 in a passerby dead. Um mm. When I got into working in Wan Chai later, and then I realized that the nightclub I'm working in is run by the 14K, and that this guy does this job for the poor, he's an assassin, this guy's a street fighter, this guy's the, the gang leader. It was just like, oh my. And I was living in the back streets of Wan Chai then. So I was living between Wan Chai and Causeway Bay in the kind of what it wasn't. A slum area is a bit too extreme, but it was extreme poverty. So my flat didn't have running water. You know, it had running one running water tap and no no bath, no nothing. My my shower was a hole in in the floor, right? And the water used to just run down and run down onto the restaurants, the roof of the restaurant below. There was no waste pipe or anything. It was. Um, yeah. And then, of course, I learned the language and you can learn a lot about a country, a place and its people by understanding the language. Then I, by this time, I'd love the food. I was doing the Kung Fu up on the roof of my building. And then I then I had a real shock because I started to learn about the people.
and their superstition and their what what you might call extreme bitchiness like especially towards the guaylo um you know massively high level of racism there and and this is fine for anyone listening guys there it's a different culture they yeah. they they only saw the first white person there uh in 18 something so or, or or maybe the very first portuguese arrived there in like 1700 or such such but what i'm trying to say is you know first time i went in china no one had ever seen a white man before ever everybody just flooded you like you were a rock star right and it's it's okay to understand racism in this construct you know they just didn't they just thought they were superior to us and and maybe they didn't i think i think it, when i worked in the nightclub area and i'd i'd see it like a chinese guy and they come in the western clubs and they just stand there looking like a i can't use the expression that comes into my mind but you know looking like the odd one out really it was like they're standing there and they just it really did look like they felt second best in their own city right and i'd go over as the doorman or whatever and i'd you know i'd see them reach for a cigarette and i'd just go over and give them a light oh my god giving them that face chris you know giving them that respect especially with some of the guys i work with it it was just like they you, they couldn't do enough for you then you know like this guaylo has just given me given me face if you look at the like the context of the history of the place as well, Chris, as you'll know, they like they've, they've been colonised, haven't they? It was a colony. It was a British colony for a long time, and um, the sort of details surrounding how we, how what we did in order to get that as a colony are are pretty shocking and horrific, and um, I think that that's left a lasting impression on a lot of the people there, especially like m more over the poorer people, like the working classes there. Um, and I think that's sort of the stem of maybe some of the, um, the perhaps, you know, the racism, some of the horrible words that are used sometimes, you know, towards foreigners. Um, but it tends to be like the working classes and the une uneducated that will use those sort of words towards foreign people like us, you know. And um, I think I, I can't imagine, I, I, I can't imagine what it must be like, honestly, to actually have been, I tried to put myself in there you know, in their shoes. And I think, what must it be like, mate, to be colonised by another country? And then the the social system, the justice system, everything is something that's kind of alien to you and it's imposed by a, a foreign power. I can't, I, I, I just, I think, so, so I try to empathise in it in a way. But, but, but you're right, you do get a bit of stick from time to time from certain elements. And um, I just think it's, um, I can't help but think it's half of our own fault, to be honest. It's like a, it's like a reaction to how badly we actually treated a lot of the people over there historically. Yeah, we can explore that a bit. So for friends listening, example of the kind of racism, which is it's it's almost quite big because there's a because there's a white European. I, I've had people racist against me. And of course, it doesn't really affect you because you're not an oppressed minority as a white European. Yeah. You're in yeah. the sort of, yeah. you know, the super, superior yeah. class. Or what, isn't it, really? Yeah. You know, I sorry, superior class isn't what I meant. I meant that you you do generally tend to have a privilege that you can go home to, right? Yeah. So yeah. I was traveling in Ghana, uh, Guyana in South America, and I went in, the, I was in the bar and the barman wouldn't serve me. I said, excuse me, can I have a beer? And he just like literally would not make eye contact. And he served this guy next to me. And they mm -hmm. speak English there. It's, you know, it's not like they don't understand English. It's an English speaking um, colony. I think Guyana was colonized by the UK, wasn't it? I think not, it, French, not, French, not French Guyana. Suriname yeah. is there, I think was the Dutch. Um, Venezuela, I think, was the Spanish, but I think Guyana was... Anyway, it's, it's irrelevant. So I'm there in Georgetown in this stream poverty. Guy wouldn't serve me. And do you know what? In, in that little microcosm now, that little mini experience, yeah, I felt awful. 
that this guy was yeah. treating me like this based on the color of my skin he didn't know me yeah. right yeah yeah so so I, I you know that's empathy isn't it when you can understand what other people go through but in hong kong it was just funny where you'd be sat on the underground so the mtr and the chinese would sit next to you that 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 they you know they weren't that against you a black chap would come in and sit opposite you and immediately the two people on either side of him would just get up and walk away it was just, mm. you know it was, yeah, it was totally, yeah. or or i've been on the underground and this old deer has like moved moved away and she's just looked up at the camera and gone the guaylo yeah he stinks yeah. He stinks and everyone's like oh yeah 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 right and, and it's just it this is what i'm saying it's that strong a thing that it's not it's not that this one's nasty or anything it's just it's a different culture it's just different um but yeah. um yeah so we stole the island basically didn't we 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 le yeah. levered it from china to use it as the base to flood the country with opium that we imported from India in order to mm -hmm. rob the silks from the place and the and the Chinese silver, we colonized mm -hmm. the whole population and used them as our as coolies. I think was the the, the kind yeah. of you know basically almost yeah. slave slave labor. They were then destined to live in big, ugly, massive um, sink estate housing areas while the Westerners took all the beautiful land in Hong Kong and they live up on the peak with, a, you know, yeah, yeah. mid-levels in these luxurious yeah. penthouse kind of skyscrapers and or well, they live in the, the, the bay at the back of Hong Kong where it's just idyllic. Yeah. Um, and their, their prospects are very limited. They, are, they will only ever be working in an office, the vast majority. Uh, of, of Hong Kongers will be sat behind a computer screen their whole lives until they die, or till they, you know, if, if they're lucky enough to retire. Yeah, it's, and on top of that, you've got the British attitude of, you know, it was the upper classes that colonized these places, wasn't it? The, 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 and the middle yeah. classes, yeah. Their, their kind of puppet middle management. Yeah. And back then it was the bloody savages, the bloody savages, yeah. you know, so the whole, yeah, just was just adding a bit of um, color there. Yeah, adding a bit more to what you said, Chris. So you can kind of understand the frustration, can't you? Really, to yes. some degree. Yeah. yeah, but but that all said, wonderful place, wonderful people. Yeah, and I think the majority of experiences are very positive. Um, well, that people have. again, we should point out to the other side of the coin. The english presence there did a lot of kind of good they weren't communist china big brother you weren't going to get pulled off the mtr for pickpocketing someone and shot dead on the platform like they were in china right you're not going to have children crippled and left in begging bowls right which yeah, again, very ha true. happening on yeah. in the mainland um yeah. there were a lot of crossover traits like you never saw disabled people in hong kong when i was there right so I'm guessing they were either euthanasiaized, i.e. like killed at birth, or they were hidden behind closed doors out, out of shame of losing face. Um, but on the other hand, you had British justice system, which was much more fair than obviously its Chinese counterpart. You had the, the system of commerce where, you know, there's still a chance in Hong Kong you can make it as a millionaire. You you haven't got that in China, right? Or you you didn't back back then under communist under this anti-capitalism type of communism that they had then. Um, so yeah, it's it. I think a lot of Cantonese people, so that's Chinese people who are born and bred in Hong Kong, actually probably now wish it was still back under the British. I think you're getting a lot of people wanting to um, what's, immigrate to or emigrate to England, aren't you? With the recent troubles that they're having over there. Yes. They made yeah, so long, we feel very close to Britain, and we have done obviously, uh, you know, an awful lot of good hospitals, you know, education systems, which of course they have in China. That, um, um, but it was like you say in the time frame, the 40s, 50s, 60s, etc., when China was struggling a lot more. Um, yeah, there was a lot of good that was done. Mm. Um, 
What was your favourite food over there, Chris? Where, where, where like Ch Hong Kong or China? Well, I either. I've been in both. Um, what's my favourite food? I can tell you what my worst food is. Um, do you want to know that? Uh, let me guess. Is it going to be related to smelly fish? No. Well, maybe one of them was. Go on then. Dick. Dick. <laughs> dick. I, I had a lot of dick. I had a lot of dick. <laughs> I bet hey, not many mate, people come on your show and say that, do they, Chris? Mate, we, we've all had to Ready do that on? in our lives. We've all had a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> we've been, pay the bill somehow. We've been spoiled. <laughs> Uh, the worst thing I ever ate, like jokes aside, was I went to I went to a restaurant and they just served like a platter of penis, and it was it was all kind of dick. Chris, there was sea lion dick, which wasn't actually that fishy to be fair. Donkey, uh, there was uh, sheep, there was dog as well, which was a little bit on the slimy side. Um, I, f I forget. There's about twelve of them though. That was the worst thing I've ever ate because I don't know if you've ever eaten. Um, like dick in China, in a, in a the restaurant itself wasn't very clean, and uh, I have to say I don't think it was properly. I don't think it was very thoroughly prepared because it stunk. It yes. stunk. It stunk, Chris, and um, that was um, that was the worst thing I've had. The best thing is probably like duck or something like that, isn't it? The duck is fantastic, and the jiao you know, the dumplings and. Um, Dim sum, of course, in Hong Kong. Absolutely. Oh, God, just Crazy talking about it makes me feel yeah. hungry. And, of course, the seafood is incredible. Lobster was yeah. my favourite. Oh, yeah. The it's way they prepare it sure. with the lemon, the lemon sort of sauce and stuff. Oh, gosh, and the garlic and the ginger. Just incredible. Makes you want to go back, huh? So when did you get your, when were you awarded your first or when did you earn your first black belt? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, um, I guess what you'd probably... Well, I, I'll tell you what, I was I was first awarded like a teacher status uh, when I was, I guess I was 18, probably. But by then I'd been doing it for, you know, five, six years, pretty much full on. So the teacher status, like as, as a, I was told to go teach, now, right, now you've qualified, off you go and teach. 18, 19, but maybe I was 19, actually. Yeah, I think. Wow. And in, in which discipline? That was Kung Fu. So um, I, it was in an art called Yao Mun uh, in Hong Kong. And um, yeah, it's a Shaolin based system that my teacher's father had taught him and his teacher's father had taught him. So it had been passed down through the generations. It was really pretty cool, I think. Uh, it's quite a rare style. Um, and it means... Can you repeat the name of it? Yeah, Yao Mun. Yeah, in Mandarin, it's yeah, in Mandarin it's Rogunman, and it means soft. So the ro the ro character means soft, same as judo in Japanese. Ju like in Japanese, if you were to pronounce it with ju, uh, yeah, a gung means kung fu, the, the same gung, and then mun. The word mun means door or gate, and it's an old, it's a term that is used before the words like nowadays. You've got ch chuen, like you know, like kun, like like. Um, Hunga kun, kun, the style or the fist. In the old days, they'd say mun, which means the, the gateway to. So it's the gateway to the soft kung fu, I suppose it was called. Mm. Um, and it was, um, so yeah, that was that was the first real thing that I um, sort of qualified in to, to go teach. Uh, yeah. And can you tell us the history or perhaps like, you know, you hear this stuff about Shaolin Kung Fu, don't you, that it was it was taught to the returning warriors when they hid out in the monastery. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. over to you. Yeah, sure. So um, any specific area? Because this is something I'll wrap it on about for hours, Chris. Well, so, just, what, the, what... just so, I mean, if I was to yeah. ask you, Chris, where did Kung Fu come from? How did it originate? Uh, what, what would you okay. tell me? Um, I'd probably bore you to death because, you know, I wrote an encyclopedia on, the, on this. So um, I, I, I'll just stop me in my tracks, Chris, if I'm waffling, because I do tend to waffle a bit. Um, so I suppose... All right, then, I'm going to stop you there. Is that enough already? <laughs> I haven't even started. Yeah, can we talk about me again, please? 
<laughs> Sorry. Like Kung Fu. <laughs> Sorry, brother. Go on. Go for it. You're all right, mate. Um, so with the Kung Fu, where did it start from? I suppose um, one popular belief is that uh, the monk called Damo, an Indian monk, was traveling. Indian, Indian Buddhist monk traveled across uh, on foot to China from India. And he landed in the northern Shaolin Temple about 2,000 years ago, something like that. And um, he was saddened. He was he was a practitioner of Kal 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 I always pronounce this wrong. Kalarata Piatu, so an Indian martial art. He landed there, and he was so he was doing yoga, and he was he was stick fighting and doing martial arts and stuff in India. And he thought, you know what, these monks need a bit of physical exercise. So he started teaching there, um, like yogic type exercise, which eventually became Shaolin Kung Fu. So that's the popular known about sort of theory, um, theory of how Kung Fu evolved. But there's another theory which is less proved, but probably more realistic. So whilst we know all that stuff did happen, um, it, the Shaolin Temple over the course of its history has also been a hiding place for bandits and criminals so um, where would you go if you're on the run all right so we know that happened and we think that maybe there was some influence from um, those people who've done martial arts um, practically and they bought their fighting arts and shared them with with the monks in the in the temple who had an interest in uh, martial arts for life preservation so it's a bit of a melting pot really Chris um, we know historically as well China, because there's records of this, um, there's, there's actual written records um, in, in paintings, cave paintings and text that there's codified martial arts been going on there for over 5,000 years. There was an art called Jiao, Jiao Ti and um, I think Jiao Di, and they would like, they'd fight, they, they, they knew through throws, they knew grabs, they knew locks, they knew headbutts, they'd wear like horned kind of antlers and you know, skewer each other for competition. So we know that codified martial arts practice was practiced there. In fact, as it was in Egypt, you know, we've got uh, the tombs of, I won't bore you with all the details, but tombs of Beni Hassan um, that they found and they've date, carbon dated it, 5,500 years old. There's hieroglyphic works there um, showing um, codified practice of martial arts, which to be honest, looks a lot like judo because there's throws and grabs and you know, breaks and um, all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's been going on for ages, mate. And I think a lot of people just claim it, don't they? And they say, well, it's ours or it's ours or, you know, for whatever reason they've got. I've just got an image here. Did you say China, the skewering? Yeah, yeah. 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 Come, come, <laughs> ra come, come round my place tonight. I'm go we're, we can eat some dick and then I'm going to skewer you. <laughs> it's not. It's got an altogether new meaning, hasn't it, though? Yeah. I don't think you're going to get many takers from that. Well, I don't know. You might be surprised. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> it's a changing world, Chris. Yes, of course. So, um, yes, Kung Fu. Did it originate as a fighting art or was it like more like a yoga or, a, you know, med meditative kind of thing or a sport? Well, I think it's fight. I think the fighting art, to be honest with you, it was rough back in the day, wasn't it? And um, in the period of cold weaponry, like, you know, steel and before we had guns and explosives and, and stuff, all of it, that, you know, gunpowder was used in that way. I think, um, I think it was much more important to be able to know your way around a, a blade, a bladed weapon. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just been practical for people to, for guards to protect certain people, to protect prisoners or to, to move prisoners around from A to B to, um, to protect gold and the transfer of gold historically those were the sort of jobs that uh martial arts were were used for so it's a you know mm. war has been around hasn't it chris for since mankind has been around and then people have wanted to get better at it better at war because it's not nice to get skewered is it so i think <laughs> i think that's you know do you know what i mean it becomes codified and then you know yes break off and do their own thing but ultimately it's all the same and they're really fighting and is it true then that i mean in cantonese it was i think it was gung fu mm -hmm. gung, 
gung they call it gung instead not not the kung that, that we do in the west is it true that means open hand or, or originally it did no it was, no that's no, karate no. isn't it karate actually i'll tell you a story so yeah karate kara te 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 is hand and kara is the chinese word for kong means empty but originally when karate was evolved you know karate originally came from china and um it was originally called china hand not empty hand but then as it transferred i think from okinawa to which is a lot closer to china and had a lot of chinese influence uh, when it transferred over to the mainland of japan they then changed the name they didn't want it to be called um chinese hand they wanted to have a more a name that would spread better in japan yeah well they've not always had the best relationships those two countries have they <laughs> that's putting it mildly yes <laughs> yeah. yeah and um how many martial arts now are you sort of proficient in what, what is it mainly chinese based ones or is it chinese it... really i've done a bit of the other stuff as well you know i've done a bit i've mixed and matched a little bit mm. um but essentially it's chinese stuff that i love yeah so i've studied a range of different kung fu's tai chi's and that's what i teach now i teach tai chi i teach kung fu and um but uh, yeah Chinese arts essentially I've studied a bunch of different Chinese Kung Fu's yeah mm. it's all the same ultimately there's just different ways of doing things and different flares and different emphasis is really I know I, I, you, you have a lot of people who come on and they they sort of say when they're talking about martial arts this is better than that and that's better than that and oh how could you say they're all similar well they are to be honest because there's only so many ways you can hit somebody isn't there? Um, yeah. you know you dress it up do you know what I mean dress it up as much as you like but ultimately that's you know I mean, the that philosophy is. has got to be that of Bruce Lee. Is it? Is it not be like one? Be I mean, you got to do whatever does the job, and you not mm -hmm. not anticipate what might do the job. You've got to be fluid in that moment. If someone's going to stick a headbutt, probably the most mm -hmm. obvious thing is just like move out the way. You know, I mean, that's the, your first reaction, isn't it? If, or avoid it before it comes. You know, if you can read the situation before. And you can see them edging closer into your space you know make sure that you've got that fence up you know that you're at a distance where you don't let them get too close you know yeah um, or just so. dilute the situation say want to eat some dick <laughs> walk this way yeah That's i'll true. show you the best dick in town <laughs> follow me down this little dark alley it's going to be interesting to see if uh, YouTube demonetized this one. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been worth it, though. It's all, yes. food. It's all food, Chris. So let, let's just get some boys' own questions at you then, Chris. So yeah. have you ever had to use it in a real situation? Yeah. Uh -huh. Tell us, what. how did that materialize? A few times. Um, a few, few times, to be honest, if you... This it didn't materialise too well. If you see this, see this knuckle's gone here. Oh, this one. flattened knuckle, yeah. See that? That's all right, that one. But this one's gone. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, I was. I got into. You know, I got into scrapes, didn't I? As a kid, growing up as a young man, looking for adventure, and not really being, not, you know, being. I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say gobshite, but like. I wasn't as a younger man. I didn't really know how to diffuse situations, Chris. And I didn't really know how to, you know, maybe I, I, I didn't know how to really communicate well, and I didn't know how to, to back down really, and to walk away. You know, I think it's lack of confidence, really. Um, ultimately, lack of self confidence uh, as a younger man, and um, so yeah, I, 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 I have had experiences which. Um, you know, resulted in, you know, fighting. Um, for the most part, I've done all right. I've, I've been able to look after myself. Um, but as you'll know yourself, when you find yourself in rough places um, and you're a bit sort of orientated towards finding a bit of adventure, sometimes you go down the wrong, you know, wrong, you go down the wrong way a little bit in life. Mm. And um, yeah, so. So, I mean, my problem, like working the door doors in Hong Kong, particularly on this one club that I mentioned, because I had the anti progression. So I went from being very spiritual, spiritualistic in my door work, which is what you need to be. Right. Yep. 
Yeah. So, for example, three six foot two black dudes would be walking down through Wan Chai, three abreast, right, blocking the pavement, blocking the sun, everything. Just yeah, yeah. right. And um, you know immediately they're American servicemen oh. off off one of the ships in the harbour, right? You know yeah. for the simple reason you don't really see. Back in the nineties, you didn't see many black people in in. You didn't see them yeah. out and about. They tended to be yeah. part of the uh, the um, uh, the immigrant community that hung around chunky yeah. or lived in chunky mansions. Right, the the, the cheapest. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah. My 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 buddy Ghanaian Ghanaian Mark, and um, so these guys would come up to the door. And of course, our club was just an RC club. It had a rule, no servicemen. And, and it also had a rule, no fur, and no, no hats. Um, it just had real finickety sort of owners. So, oh, hang on. Hey. <laughs> so I'd just like to do a little bit, little bit of Kung Fu every now and then to keep my... Um, Keep yeah, my, clean the nasal passages keep, yeah, yeah keep, and keep my skills up you know because you never know do you i mean you never know anyway never know. so so there i am i got three guys that are each of them are twice the size of me mm. they come up to the door and they do the you know go to walk in the club and you'd have to go gentlemen i can't let you in i'm afraid uh, why not motherfucker uh it's it, uh, uh, could, uh, the, there's no serviceman, <laughs> right? And I, 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 I that point, went down well, didn't it? After a few oh years, oh my god, I'd point to the board which literally had 20 rules listed on it, right? Anyone who remembers Joe Bananas in Hong Kong will know exactly what I'm talking about, right? There's they had a board which listed it, you know, it's almost like things like no boas, and it was just. I, I got it, I got it. It's like if you've got too much money and you've got too much power, you you can yeah. invent a load of crazy shit rules anyway so how do you know we're servicemen mother trucker i'm like um because like i've lived in hong kong eight months and i've never even seen another black guy let alone three walking side by side uh in perfect formation where yeah wearing georgetown sweatshirts with the muscles you guys have got look at that look at that <laughs> and then the guys are oh yeah you know yeah i, I work out and i am like, oh well I, I was military yeah i was in the uh, in the marines back in the day oh you're a marine oh do you yeah okay all right we're gonna go and find somewhere else cheers buddy right and that was it i, I was a good doorman you know i could diffuse yeah. situation i i could see stuff happening i could see trouble i knew how to go up to a guy and go you're right bud Guy giving you our time, mate. Just, just ignore. Just, ign oh yeah, thanks, mate. You know, it's just little psychological techniques mm. to diffuse trouble without having to fight or throw somebody out, right? Um, by the time I'd worked through three nightclubs and I was in my fourth, one of those nightclubs instantly was a DJ of the biggest club in southern China, which is just another, another adventure again, but. By the time I got in this triad run club, I was so like strung out on the crystal meth that I'd, I'd gone from being that nice, cozy, sort of docile, not docile, but you know, disarming doorman to someone that really felt quite violent and needing, you know, not, I'm not gonna take any yeah. shit. I'll, I'll, I'll work with the triads, you know, this guy's a, yeah. an assassin, this guy's a street buyer, don't come in our club and fuck with us, right? And the trouble it was, Chris, I didn't know how to fight. <laughs> <laughs> but I was fearless. Right, yeah, that is a yeah. bad combination. <laughs> so the next time these, um, you know, next time there's an American or the next American ship that came in, one of these dudes, and I'm telling you, if you're listening, they're like basketball players. They are huge. These African-Americans that man the ships. Not all of them are huge, obviously, but they just have just they come from big stock, you know. So I got this guy wandering around in basketball kit. I mean, literally had a basketball vest on, and he's got a beer that he's bought in the 7-Eleven. 
And of course, I'm like, dude, don't drink that. Whereas before I'd go, bud, look, can I just put that down here for you? Just grab it on the way out. It's just my boss. He'll get up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The guy would have gone, oh, yeah, buddy. Yes. Yeah. No, instead, I'm like, hey, dude, fucking yeah. outside with that. You know, like my attitude yeah, yeah. is changing. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. And of yeah. course, I, I threw these two dudes, dudes out. And uh, then they, or I threw this dude out and he came back 10 minutes later with one of his mates who was equally as huge. And they stood at the top doorway going, come on out, mother trucker. Come on, we, we are going to kill you. We are going to. And I like being, you know, not never having backed down from a fight. I just wandered up. I started to make yeah. my up the steps. Fortunately, the tr triad big brother the gang leader was counting the money at the left counting the takings at the lectern and he went this guy never looked at you he just what his body told you what to do and he went just put his arm out like that and i kind of stopped and then the guy's like come on then mother trucker come on out we're gonna kill and i'm like so i went for it again and the boss goes and uh when a triad uh, big brother tells you not to do something you you have to obey right when you're bossing in under confucianism tells you anything you you have to obey so i was quite pleased he, <laughs> he intervened um because those guys probably would have beaten the shit out of me chris you know so have you ever been in that oh i mean have you um can you give us examples of have you ever been unfairly picked on where the other guy's not going to back down and you've had to oh, yeah. think. Oh fuck yeah! How did you? How oh, did many, you well, quite a few down? times, mate. Quite a few times. Um, where there's a number of them, do you mean? Or well, whatever. I'm just I'm looking for a story. Come on, we want some Bruce Lee shit. What? Being a bit evasive, aren't I? Really? Yeah, you're being um, humble, mate. And this um, humble right. is. There's a time and a place for humble, and it's not now. Well, I'll tell you. A, I'll tell you a story that winded me up in um, a Sri Lankan prison, if you like. For a few days it wasn't very long um so yeah i was out there on holiday and um with my girlfriend at the time and her sister and um i don't know if you've ever been to Sri Lanka, it's a lovely country and they do these great oil massages right <laughs> and nothing funny about it but they're quite into their ayurvedic medicine so here i am on the beach having or in the hotel having this massage and um my girlfriend comes running in with her sister and her sister's like got a big massive welt on her head across her face and i'm like well, what are you disturbing my uh, massage for girls I'm sorry, i didn't i said what's wrong what's wrong and they said well this guy outside had just um basically he jumped on uh, one of the girls and tried to sexually assault her plain day on the beach and um, the sister had got involved and gone, what the fuck are you doing? Tried to drag him off and he, he picked up a log that was on the, and whacked her across the head with it. And um, again, I was a younger man at the time and, and um, a little bit more temperamental, I suppose. So I went to say, so right, which direction did he go in? Because it's not acceptable, is it? Doing that sort of thing is not acceptable, right? So I'm not one to get into trouble myself. I don't go looking for it. But I was in quite, I was in a very bad mood at what I'd just seen, you know, and heard. And so I went, I went, I went, I went looking for him and I got him. And uh, he was in the next village along. <clears throat> and um, it didn't, it didn't go well for him. Uh, I gave him a bit of a hiding, to be honest. And um, then some banana farmers came down with, with the machetes and all that. Um, and it, it, it got a little bit ugly. It got a little bit ugly. Cut a long story short, I ended up. Um, I, I, I knew the police were sort of looking for me, so I handed myself in because uh, they told did me that, so I went back to the hotel. Did you disarm yeah. the people with the machetes, or did you knock them out or something? Or? I, I, I took out th I took out three of the lads with this one with this one bloke, right? And um, and then when the machetes lot came, I, I, I spoke to them. I said, right, this is da -da -da -da. I kind of like I thought, fucking, hell, I'm not. I don't want to get into this. I'd done what I needed to do. I'd spoken to and had words, let's say, with. Um, with those other guys um and i managed to kind of de-escalate a little bit with the banana farmers to be fair there was probably about 10 of them with big hooked machetes i'd have been mince me you know um, i managed to de-escalate and get out very quickly then i went back to the hotel and they told me you know um 
police are looking for you. So I went, I, as far as I was concerned, I didn't do anything wrong. So I went to the police station and I said, look, I'm here voluntarily. Um, this is what happened. And uh, they decided to hold me because they wanted money. Then they said, well, what's happened is the one guy who did what, you know, you said he did, he crushed his uh, windpipe. So he had to go to hospital. He's in hospital, he's got to pay for it. So, you know, that crushed his, you know, and uh, so I wasn't going to pay, basically. I was a little bit um, belligerent about it. I'm like, I'm, I, I, I'm not, I'm not fucking, you know, you, you wait, you're trying to rape somebody in midday, a girl, then somebody else gets involved and you hit them across the head, a young woman with a log. Um, I've gone to try and catch him for you. A fight has broken out and his mates have come out and they've been acted violently. So what am I supposed to do? Two of them tried to grab me and put my hands back. I was like, I'm not having that. So I gave him a good hiding. And um, as a result of that, some the, the chap had got injured with his voice box. He couldn't speak. It was quite funny, actually, because they came down to the station um, after his hospital treatment. He was kind of like, <laughs> speaking like that. And um, <laughs> I have to say, I, I, I didn't feel sorry for him. My normal <laughs> Buddhist um, empathy just wasn't, wasn't really there that day. Um, so, you know, and the, the chap was known to the police and it wasn't the first time he'd done it, apparently. So, yeah, I, I have kind of, in my younger days, I have kind of, um, you know, I have sort of um, got myself in, in and out of sort of trouble. But I, 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 would, I was never going to look for trouble, Chris, and I was never trying to hurt anybody at all. Um, but, but certain things, I, I, I feel very strongly that sometimes we have to act um, in, in certain circumstances, mate, you know, so, yeah. Probably yeah. could have handled it a bit better, but, you know. Yeah, I was chatting the other, when I spoke to Steve Green the other day, we, we, we were chatting along a similar thing, and that is, in our day, if you were out of order, you got a punch, you know, and then it taught you not to be out of order the next time. Now, there's yeah. so many protective measures in place and laws against that kind of behaviour, and to a degree, it's quite rightly so, but you know there was a reason that you got punched or you punched someone it's when that they overstepped the mark and by taking away that kind of um that control measure let's say you then give people an unrealistic idea of what it is to be in a community and by community i mean our you know local community our community as a country or the internet yeah. commu community right so you got young people now it's quite funny you know they talk to 51 year old 51 year old combat veteran like you're a piece of shit <laughs> right not that being a veteran means that you did i know what you say you know respect is earned it's not something you just get given because you were in the forces yeah. when you were when you were a teenager right but but what i mean is it's like dude i'm i'm like 51 when I was your age, we would never have spoken to, you know, no, it's not, no. not even like being like abusive or anything. I just mean that like the whole way is like, yeah, well, fuck, you know, there's this kind of, you know, my narratives just like way more important to me than yours, dude. And, you know, you don't understand it. And it's like, dude, I'm, I'm 51. I've lived in 87 countries. I, I kind of like know life probably yeah. a bit better than you and, 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 because you've been allowed to get away with this attitude all your life because no one's ever been allowed to smack you one you you you're living under the delusion that this this way of being is acceptable and this yeah. and it and it's not about the the pain that you're putting out onto others with this belligerent you know i can say what the hell i want you know it's the fact that you're going in the complete opposite direction of uh I was going to say enlightenment, but probably maybe you'll end up so unhappy that that you won't come around to it. Yeah, you'll 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 do what I did, get so unhappy. You've got to work out enlightenment, but yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, interesting. Different age, different age. What about the fighting spears? The the, the Asagai. Did I see you doing a bit of TV TV work around that? You know, like the, uh, in, the Zulu fighters. Zulu. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's Zululand. Yeah, I went out to film um, a show out in uh, in in. Well, we were out in Durban, and then we went out from um, out into Zululand. Yeah, and I got to um, have a fight with um, who was the tribal champion. Actually, uh, he was the son of a son of a chief out there, and I absolutely loved that place, man. Those people are so warm. They're so incredible. Such such an incredible race of people. Mm. So yeah, I got to spend time out there and. Went to see shamans and uh, witch doctors and spent time with them. Um, and I've, I've done that kind of stuff before, you know, in South America and in various parts of Asia. Um, but yeah, Zululand was incredible. So I, yeah, we had a we had a stick fight. So I um, funny story there if you're interested. I I was um, at the time again. The, 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 I guess when was that man? That was like I was living in South Korea at the time. And my son used to play. Do you remember the Wii? Like the Wii? He had the Wii. Do you ever have a Wii? It's like one of them. Ah, uh, uh, yes, yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? That, that, um, it's like a game. It's like the old Atari, like Xbox or whatever. Yeah. You so, used anyway, to... he used to be, he, Chris, he used to be playing this game, right? On, on there. There's this Wii Sports. And it was like, I think it was like Kendo or Stick Fighting. Or, it was Kendo or something like that on there. And you get these hand controllers and you move them around. And, um, I was trying to do the research because I knew I was going out there to fight and um, I was trying to find like what, how do these guys fight? I'd never experienced it before. I'd never really seen it. And I got a couple of videos on YouTube, which kind of gave you a hint about their stick fighting art, which is really, really cool by the way. And, um, and, and I was talking to my son about it. He was about five or six years old at the time. And he was like, dad, come on, let's practice on the Wii. This is how you're going to do it. And anyway, my, my six year old son came up with this strategy, like on the Wii that, when they hold the, the stick this way uh, on this sword fighting game, if you strike that way, it's going to block the stick, right? So where, whenever the stick's up, you don't hit them across, you hit them down. Whenever the sticks, if, the, if their block is across, then you hit them across. And so I just trained that in and I was, I was trying to move in a certain way so I could take advantage of the way that they, they defend and, and, uh, and it worked, surprisingly. Yeah, it's very good, very, yes. very interesting. Incredible. I love all the, the um, African history. Yeah, yeah. All, all the stuff about the, the Zulu. Sounds unfair saying the Zulu Wars, isn't it? It's more like the Zulu genocide. Oh, um, mate. Just yeah. another native yep. population genocided to make way for white European progress. And no, I'm not bashing white European people here, folks. I'm, I'm just, I'm actually talking about history. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, you, you, you it, it's easy to look back at a situation, and understand it. That's one thing, isn't it? Like, I understand it. You had very, you know, money and wealth orientated settlers arrive on a nation that looked like the land of the continent yeah. and looked like the land of milk and honey, man. The only yeah. trouble is, there's some other people living here, but. <laughs> Their yeah. ways are such di so different to us. We can kind of like manipulate them for the most part. You know, we'll just give them a load of shit and tell them it's cool. And then if they yeah. don't, if that doesn't work, we'll get the old guns out because they've only got spears and we'll, yeah. that, that will send them a good message. And then of course you encroach more and more on their, their pastoral land and their, their hunting grounds and their ag agricultural lands that, that they've got no choice but to fight back, at which case you massacre them in their thousands, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's not, not, it is just the way of the world, isn't it? But the, when, you, when you're in Soweto, so the ghetto in, in Johannesburg, the township, as, it, as it's called, you actually are looking at the repercussions of our behavior back in the 19th century when we had like uh, Rourke's Drift and Is uh, Isalwanda. Yeah. Is Is you know, yeah. you're, you're actually looking at the displacement of these people in their own homeland that are now shoved into shanty towns. Um, they still have their history, they still have their spears, you know, and they still, they still sing and dance the tribal songs. Yeah. But, so it, it, you know, it is a thing. It, it, it's not like, oh, that that was ages ago in history, Chris. You know, we, it's like, no, it's it's still to this day they're they're the oppressed minority. It's affecting and, people, yeah, it's affecting yeah. people uh, all over the world, yeah. 
but yeah, I I love you know I've read a lot of Wilbur Smith. He talks about the Asagai, the stabbing spear, and the, the you know the, yeah. the shields and the impi warriors, and and the horns of the bull was their fighting tactic, yeah. wasn't it? Their pincer movement was called the horns of the horns, yeah. horns yeah. of the bull. Yeah. Can we talk about your television work? Because that's quite um. That's great, yeah. You know, it's quite an achievement, isn't it, to get yourself on TV? Now, now it's the opposite. Yeah. No one wants to be on mainstream media, but right. <laughs> well, very, very, very. I guess Aunt Middleton still does. Bless him. <laughs> Sorry, that sounded really patronising, and I didn't mean it like that. I just meant he's doing really well with it, isn't he? You know, he's he really, show. really, he's really smashing out the TV shows, and good, good credit to the guy. Um, but. Um, yeah, you've done a lot of it. How did it? How did it come around? Yeah. Um, well, long story short, I suppose um, about two year two thousand. I think I ninety nine two thousand. I came back to the UK. I've been overseas for a long time, and um, went to drama school and started doing bits and bobs in theatre. I wasn't very good, um, and uh, I wasn't paying the bills. I was renting this like rooftop apartment which was an absolute shithole in north london just struggling to pay the bills mate and honestly it was like it didn't even have a toilet in this place this is in north london it was like it was in the, there was like a, a toilet in the bedroom that reeked to piss it was dreadful like absolute hovel and um yeah so i just thought i can't i can't do this and getting odd gigs in theater and stuff so i started um trying to break into tv so i wrote a bunch of formats for tv started pitching them around no one was listening uh knocking on doors and i just thought well I, I believe that there could be a show in martial arts on tv and so i started meeting producers going to production houses around london and most of them said the same thing to me it's a niche within a niche it's never gonna you're never gonna do that it's just not interesting uh and then 2003 i've got uh, a job at the bbc making the show that, that I'd, I'd um, created, Mind, Body, Kick-Ass Moves. And it was basically, it was like, I, I've done a lot of traveling in my time, I've done a lot of studying with different masters. That's what the show's about. Uh, so I went around and just filmed with loads of different masters in different countries and see what they did, get, get involved with their stuff. And um, lo and behold, that first one, they played that on the BBC for five years, mate, nonstop, just kept repeating it. Um, it held viewers. It just held the viewership. And um, at the can we, time... Can yeah. I ask you about the money side of it then? What what, sure. what was your... How did you... How was that an earner for you? So, uh, yeah, so basically I got paid as a presenter. So I had three contracts uh, with them. One was as a presenter. Um, I got um, back-end payments as well as the writer. I got a writer payment and I got... Um, a creator, whatever it is, I forget the name of the contract, but it basically gave me um, a really good percentage. I forget what it was. It was a really good percentage of international sales. And then the show, of course, um, became one of the best selling BBC TV shows in his in BBC TV history, bizarrely for something that was niche and from BBC Three. They sold it to over 180 countries worldwide. So um, it wasn't kind of, it's not, it's BBC Three money. So it's not the kind of, you can't, you can't retire on it. But um, I was able to pay my bills for the first time in my life, you know, and, um, you know, uh, yeah. So that, so that did really well. Um, that's how it started, Chris. You know, it's just like uh, perseverance, really knocking on doors and just saying to people, no, I believe it when they're telling you, no, no, it's no good, it's no good, no good. Yes. Uh, it's like me talking into my webcam, isn't it? It's, you, it's, it's right. It all somewhere. comes from... So it's got, you've got to have, like, that self-belief to start with and just believe in it and to start doing it and eventually... Whatever it is, you'll get there, you know. Yeah. And did the BBC try to interfere with the narrative much? Did they try to shape it this way or that? Or was it just not really that sort of programme? It did a bit on the first one. Uh, uh, sorry, it did It did a little bit. Um, on the second one more so, I would say, the second se series that I did with them. Um, yeah, there was a bit more of, of that going on. And, like, when you first go into TV... You, or any kind of creative thing, Chris, you know yourself, you're like, you're quite precious about the work that you're doing and you think, well, no, I've got this vision, I want it to be like this and you fight for that and stuff. But 
eventually like I came to realize that um, I was a bit late to the party really realizing this because I'm a bit dim that, that way but you realize actually you know what what these people are saying is actually they know their job really well and they're they're trying to tailor it to their audience so just make it you know be more collaborative and I wasn't when I first started I wasn't as collaborative I was more you know I still had that hard mindset of like no this will work which is what you've got to have to get to that first place but then you need to soften yourself and say right now I'm here I need to collaborate and work with people and kind of take their opinions on board more without losing your own shape and that's a skill in itself because you're either like from my training probably similar to yours Chris it's like you're either taking orders or you're giving them it's one or the other you know what I mean and then so to be the guy who's you've gone from you're like well no I'm not taking orders now I'm giving them um, in terms of your, you, do you know what I mean? In terms of your, your physical training and your, your martial arts or your, your military background or whatever. So you, 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 you get to a position of authority where you finally, the vision has worked and, and this thing's working and you want, and you're still strong to that vision, but then you have to soften yourself a lot and really start taking on board like other people's. I know it's, mate, it's probably makes me sound like an absolute wanker, but it's not like that. It's like you've got a strong vision, hey. but you have to. You know what I mean? You've got to develop that skill set, Chris. Yeah? Mate, to, we to be do a whole podcast and it would be like a five hour one just discussing what you're saying because it's, I mean, I'll give you one example from writing. You know, my history until I did podcasting was writing for the previous 10, 10 years. Um, yeah. And there are so, there is so much stuff to learn to be a consummate writer and publisher. By yeah, publisher, right. I don't mean necessarily like you've got your own publishing, I mean to, to understand the process of it all. Yeah. And there's a balance between your art and what's gonna sell. There's a balance yeah. between your you creativity go. and what needs to be edited. There you go. There's a balance between your morals and giving the audience what 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 they want that for me obviously as a, as a, someone who tries to be a bit moralistic in my at least in what i what i you know put out on my youtube channel that's the hardest one is mm. you know uh, it, 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 i don't know if you ever notice i in all my military videos or anything to do I'm, i always want to explain both sides of the fence you know mm. i just want to explain the like what war really is and you know what conflict really is and that's because i can't i could easily have a channel just saying that oh military soldiers are oh, they're the best people in the world they're just all heroes and 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 yeah you know and then bang they're smashing this audience down on the, this enemy and bang you know it's not really telling the true story is it and <laughs> if i thought I don't mind young people listening to my story and thinking, do you know what? I want a bit of that. I'll, I'll join them. You know, that that's just life. Right. But I want them to know that I have told you, right. Forget the freedom and democracy shit. That's just the rhetoric they tell you at the recruiting office. You know, you'll go in to massacre other teenagers and a lot of people will get very rich off it. Right. You, you need to know that that's primarily your role. I'm not saying that, you know, you might yeah, not, yeah. You might not be um, deployed in a peacekeeping, you know, a genuine peacekeeping capacity, but but when you look back at war and who's traditionally profits from it, it's not the people. It's <laughs> so, not the young kids so, involved. So I get it. I, I get it. I can see where, you know, you've had to compromise. I can see where it's like, uh, and it's mm. exactly the same with YouTube, Chris. Mm. You know? At some point, you have to, I don't want to say take a knee, but it's the equivalent. At some point, you've just got to just, yeah. like, take one for your own team. And, it, and it's hot. And, you know, but if you're putting content out and no one's watching it and it's not working the YouTube out, there isn't much point yeah. being on that platform. You've yeah. got to move. Yeah. You've got to move on. And for me, I balance it up a lot with saying, well, look, I think overarchingly, the message I put out helps young people, you know. Yeah, it yeah. helps them make sense of life. You know, sometimes yeah. it's brutally honest and not 
everyone's ready for that but it's that's just it on the other hand you know you have to sometimes like i've never resorted to the clickbait thing and i see most other content producers do they'll put a video out that's it i'm quitting and you're like oh my god my my favorite content provider is quitting youtube but he's got yeah. like 10 million subs i've got to yeah. watch this and they, you know he says that's it guys i'm quitting sugar <laughs> you're like oh all oh, right oh, yeah okay so you've just got like 15 million views off the back of a complete ruse yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I think ultimately that pisses people off chris doesn't it i mean it pisses me off if i'm watching something and you just you know oh, it's just i've just been like i've just been tricked into clicking this it's like i don't want to go there again in the future um it just annoys me so i think to have a genuine following is much more important than just having yeah. the numbers you know and, and it's interest you know it, it it just is interesting and i think the problem guys like you and i are going to have to to negotiate chris is that we've got we understand that our moral compass is intrinsically tied into our spiritual well-being they, they're not mutually exclusive the decisions we make in this life are what we will have to live with you know not in eternity is not the right thing but you know we have to live with under universal law so mm -hmm. you know if i yeah, well, we, we just have to. And, and it becomes something that when you're working with other people, you then have to negotiate. Mm. Um, for example, a YouTube producer wants you to be the most controversial, hateful, bitter, backstabbing. I'm not talking about my wonderful Ben here, by the way, although we have had, you know, conversations of right. this nature. Yeah. What What is the channel about? And, and I get it. He's got, you know, yeah. we, we, we could make a hundred thousand dollars next year is easily chris you know everything's in place to do that but i won't do it because you I'll know sell it now it's like when the devil took jesus up on the mountain and said look around all this is yours if you come and work for me and jesus said you know if, he said if i come and work for you i've got nothing yeah <laughs> it doesn't matter what i've got my material you know i've i've compromised my myself yeah yeah so yeah it's it, it is fascinating um and also then there's the artistic level isn't it you know i i've always tried to whenever a publishing company's edited my books i've always demanded to see what the changes they want to make before they change them right so i before yeah. it's too late and yeah and it it rocks one of two ways some changes have to be made whether you like it or not they just that story that you think is hilarious it's actually not that funny to other people yeah that, that yeah that bit yeah. that descriptive you know the super fast sleek lined turbocharged sports it's like chris that's a sporty car that's what the audience yeah, yeah. here is a sporty yeah, car they, yeah. they know what a sporty car is mate you don't have to fucking go yeah adjectives right yeah. So some of those things they're just a given right yeah that's got to be changed right? but then there's other things that if you employ military humor your editor isn't going to get it and some right. of these editors they're quite dorky they'll be like yeah but that's not funny it's like it is to me it's hilarious and it will be you know and to yeah. the people that get it it will be yeah. funny i know a lot of people won't but i'm not catering for them i'm an artist i i do my art and if people like it they buy into me they don't like it they don't buy into me this is but i stay true to myself right so you've got that as well um i can just only think that with the amount of tv work you've done you must have faced a lot of this, this yeah definitely, this definitely. A lot of scrutiny mate scrutiny really and it's it's hurtful at first when someone says no you're not saying that i'll tell you about it i, I say I, I i know exactly what you mean about that funny thing i was in a um just this is how kind of tired you get sometimes when you're on the road. I was doing a series for the BBC, Kick-Ass Miracles. And um, looking back now, I'm so glad they edited this out because it's it's really stupid. But at the time I was like, this is the fucking best thing since sliced bread. I was in a graveyard doing this piece to camera about, we'd just been like some of the graveyards in the Philippines, you know, they're like open. So there's a lot of, um, you know, bones and bodies and stuff like that. Um, 
and um, we've been been in their film. I don't actually think it made. I don't think I'm not sure. Can't remember if that made it into the show anyway. But it was interesting because like people were living in the graveyard, and um, for some stupid reason, Chris, I got it into my head um, that it would be good to quote Duran Duran lines from songs while I was doing this piece to camera. So I was like, you see, if you look around, if you look now all around, there's no sign of life. You know that song. You know, there's no sign. Uh, uh, no and for, I got it into, like, uh, yeah, I just got it into my fucking head, Chris. I was like, I think I was so exhausted. 90 days of filming, we'd been like, like 40, 50 flights. No, I think it was about 30, 40 flights in 90 days, just exhausted, not sleeping, making really bad decisions, like thinking I'm going to do some pieces to camera about something, you know, you just kind of, kind of switch off and it all goes a bit dark. And I thought, right. I just started dropping lines from Duran Duran everywhere I was going. And thankfully, albeit Duran Duran is a very brilliant band from Birmingham, I think, um, they edited all, all that out, Chris. Um, so uh, you do start, you, you, you do, when, you know, when you get into it, you kind of, yeah. So it's uh, at the time you're thinking, what do you mean? Why you, that, that is funny. It's, it's brilliant. And it's like, well, you're the only one that thinks that. And that, it hurts, doesn't it, Chris, when people it, tell you you've been a knob? It, you won't know this, but it, it, it sounds like one of the stupid things that you do when you're on a cocaine binge. Right. And you think that this dialogue you come out with is so fucking fun. And then, like, you look around and, like, no, no, no one's just getting what the fuck you're saying. <laughs> and then you have to wake yeah. up in a world of cringe, like, oh, God. Oh, man. God, yeah. I, I I thought I was being so witty and yeah, yep. cutting edge and, and it wasn't, you know, and yeah. it, like oh god, yes. Well, so, yes. Just, back to your back to your answer though, Chris. Yeah, to, to your question, you're absolutely right. It's uh, you know, it's kind of it's soul destroying at first, especially if you come from that very black and white world where it's one or the other. So you have to learn to take criticism, but you've also got to filter out the nonsense and keep keep to your vision as well. Yeah, but, but, but be open to, to you know, but be open to being wrong, you know. I think for me it works the other way quite a lot because my producer tells me what I do, what I do well. Yeah, not, not that I, I don't like need. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, for people listening, I don't need yeah. adoration or to be told I'm. It's nothing about that. It's about you know trying to get the best show possible and what some things are going to work, some things are not. You're always going to piss someone off. But of ideally, you want to piss off the most minimum people. You you know you want to try to yeah. appeal to the people you want to appeal to, and not not hack them off, right? So yeah. my um producer, he's like, "Of oh, course, your podcast is just really good," and I'm like, "Really? Oh, okay." I'm I just struggle yeah. through them to be honest. <laughs> I feel like I struggle through a lot of them. Not not. What do you know. mean? I thought you were enjoying this conversation, Chris. <laughs> Mate, I'm offended. How dare you? It was the dick thing. It's just <laughs> that's it. It's ruined it, isn't it? No, uh, chats like this. A bit of like, dick on a Sunday. <laughs> chats like this, I absolutely love. But sometimes, <laughs> you 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 chat to someone and and like you're just not like on each other's wavelength. Yeah, it yeah. it happens quite a lot with people that are used to being a bit, you know hoity-toity in their past or you know they're very well educated and they, they don't get the social cues of jokes like a like a working class person but you know like the dick yeah. thing they'd be like oh horrified oh, oh okay yeah yeah <laughs> just, oh, well, you've nice just bit, killed that that was supposed to be funny and you've just killed it and now i'm sat here feeling <laughs> stupid trying and then i've got to recover from it with something that you know i've got to rescue this situation and some people they just you just don't like I know if I stop talking, you'll start talking and you'll say something fascinating. Some people you stop talking and they go uh, like that. That was your cue. <laughs> say something, say something. Yeah, that was your cue. So like I really get it. I I I and I there's so much, you know, this so I, I did a I think a two and a half hour podcast with a, a guy called Denny Denholm, another fellow Marine or a fellow Marine, I should say. And it was because he's just uh, about to publish a book and he wanted my advice on it. You know, what, what, 
how yeah. do you start a publishing company? What, what, da, 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 da. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, we had a two and a half hour conversation and it's just stuff he's never heard before. You know, just silly, the silly little nuances of being involved in the art world, you know, um, and, and why some things will work why others won't, why some methods of distribution are good for certain things, but they're going to fall down, you know. It's like, yes, everyone can release a Kindle book. It's not difficult. You could do it in 30 minutes if you really... Doesn't mean it's A, going to be good, or B, anyone's going to read it. <laughs> right? yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. what, what, what do you want from, you know, I'll say to someone, what do you want from your writing? You want to sell books? You know, do you want people to read it or you just want the kudos to say, yeah, I'm, I'm a published author and having some in. So, yeah, fascinating. It's I, the similar lines I could draw with the martial arts, Chris, you know, because we have guys who like I, I teach martial arts online and we have some guys who've been doing martial arts for a long time. They come to us and they want to learn our style of doing things. So, for example, it's like Tai Chi, right? So I've got a Tai Chi franchise at the moment. So people who've been doing martial arts for a while can come and learn with me. Beginners can come and learn with me or people have been doing it for a while. And what you find quite often is when somebody goes out to start teaching, um, when they first come out teaching, same as they first write their book or they get published or, or they go to publish something, they think that the world is going to come to them. So they're good people, but they just haven't been through the process before. And so they think that, well, as soon as you open your doors to teaching or you publish your first book, that you're going to get customers coming through the doors just because of, who you are and you know your stuff and you, you know your, you, you, you know your content very well. But it doesn't work that way in the same way as martial arts. Like our guys need to go out and actually build the business as well. It's not just about opening your doors and, you know, it was that Kevin Costner film, build it and they shall come. It's nonsense, isn't it? It doesn't work that way. you got to understand the business. you got to understand the marketing. Can I just cor correct you there? Just a silly little point. Yeah. I did a video the other day on the, the Mandela effect, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's basically loose or it's related to false mem false group memory syndrome where groups remember things that aren't as, aren't as they were. Not so a whole yeah. group, a whole swathe of society will remember yeah. that Darth Vader said, Luke, I'm your father, right? Everyone will tell you that. And it wasn't, it was, well, this is where it all becomes a bit debatable. It was, no, I'm your father, right? That's the, that's the line that is yeah. in the film if you were to go and buy it tomorrow, right? The question yeah. we were posing in my chat the other day is, is this some sort of like deep state CIA psyop? Because some things have clearly been changed. Like, for example, the bodybuilder Franco Colombo, who everyone knew as Franco Colombo, if you lived in the 80s, he, he was Arnold's best friend. Was he the Hulk? Uh, that's Louis Fringo, right? I don't right, okay. Yeah. Another Italian American or a yeah, yeah. I think I think yeah. Franco was Louis actually Frino. Italian, whereas Louis was Italian American. Um, but no, Franco Colombo's name has now been changed to Colombo, right? With no explanation, right? And my I'm trying yeah. to say to people, look, it's it's like flat earth theory. It's a psyop. They they want you to get in this rabbit wormhole that's so far away from the real shit we should all be, you know, asking us. Worried about, yeah. But you just said then, um, if you build it, they will come. Would you be surprised if I told you that's not the line in the film? Oh, my God. Are you serious? Yeah. The line, that is the line that if you'd asked me, what yeah, does he yeah. say in film yeah, yeah. dreams, Kevin Costner, I'd go, well, if you build it, they will come. You know, he's oh, talking about yeah, 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 yeah. A being the, 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 old, the old school basketball, uh, baseball players, right? No, That's it. he says, if you build it, he will come. No, really? Yeah. If, Jeez, if you build it, funny. he will come. He being the... Uh, 60s or 50s baseball star that Kevin Costner's got a bit of a sort yeah. of man crush on, yeah. isn't he? Or or is it was yeah, it his yeah. dad or something? Um yeah. yeah, it's if you build it, he will come. Jeez. The same as um Mama always said, life was like a box, life was like a box of chocolates. You never really know what you're gonna get. <laughs> is that the is that the green mile? Uh that was Forrest Gump. 
Okay. Whereas the line people think he said is, Mama always said, life is like a box of chocolate. He doesn't say is, he says was. It's just, yeah. it's just one of those yeah. things. Some of them are just genuine folks' memories. Like some people think there was only four people in the JFK car, but there wasn't, there was six. That's just part of history. There was six. There was the Senator yeah. sat in front of him or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that is a genuine group false memory. The same as people that think Nelson Mandela died in prison. Again, group false memory. Um, Do can people think that? Who some... thinks that? Say again. Never heard that. Who thinks that? I've never heard that. That Nelson Mandela died in prison. Of course he didn't. It's called the Mandela effect because when yeah. Nelson Mandela actually died, which was yeah. in 2000 and some things, yeah. Having been president of South Africa, right? We all yeah. know he was president of South yeah. Africa. Yeah. Um, people just start coming out of the woodwork and going, he can't be dead. He died in prison. Well, we we, we know he didn't die in prison because he was president of South Africa after he got out of prison. But a lot of people, like we're talking hundreds of thousands, if not millions, think he died in prison. It's called That was why it's called the Mandela effect. Okay, I didn't know that. That's bizarre. And because stuff really is changing, like for example mm. in America, it's that there was a cartoon called the 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 Berenstein Bears, right? The Berenstein, which is a, a Norwegian surname, I'm guessing, or du or, or um, Danish or something, right? Um, it's now changed to the the Berenstein Stain A I N, is that right? <laughs> And, and everyone's like, no, it's the Berenstein Bears. And we grew up with, right? So some of it is, um, I, I think there's uh, shenanigans going on. I think it's per per things have, like Franco, it's Franco Colombo. It just was. His name, if you go and look at the old photos on the internet, it's Franco Colombo in the, you know, in, in old videos, it's Franco yeah, Colombo. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wikipedia, they've changed it to Colombo. Even Arnold Schwarzenegger calls him Franco Colombo. He never says Franco Colombo. Yeah. It doesn't, it's yeah. not even yeah. Italian. I don't even think it's an yeah. Italian surname. No, it's more, it sounds more Spanish if it's with a U, doesn't it? Yeah. Or something like that. Uh, here's, yeah. here's one for you, actually. I've just remembered, Chris. Cheese and onion crisps when you were a kid, kid green or blue? You're asking someone who knows the answer to that because I was. Okay, I thought, I suspected you might know that. I was. But it's a common one, isn't it? I was always salt and vinegar. Yeah. Salt and vinegar was always blue, right? No, it's cheese and onion is blue. There you go. That's it. Everyone says the salt and vinegar was blue. The salt and vinegar, cheese I think. Cheese and onion's blue. blue now. Yeah. Green now. It's cheese Green. and onion is blue now. Yeah. I think it always was, but it's one of those false memories because I got caught out with it the other day. They're blue. I am aware that there was a time in my life where I looked at them and went, they've changed the colour. I, I am aware of that. So they did change. Yes, they did change. Whether they've changed back again. Um, Frightening, isn't it? Yeah. Something's going on, Chris. Yeah, I mean, there's loads of other... I mean, for example, Sex in the City. Surely... Um, Oh, what's it called? It, it was all right. Let's take another one. It was Interview with a Vampire, right? That was the name of yeah. this film, or was it a series? It was Interview yeah, with a Vampire. Film, right? it, with Tom, Tom Cruise. Yeah, if you look for that Red now, Red. it's Interview with the Vampire. Oh, is it? Yeah, and you, you won't be able, you'll be hard, you will find references with a vampire, but sometimes they're like secondhand ones where someone else has called it that because they thought it was that, but right. Like the girl in Jaws, Dolly, when when uh, not Jaws, uh, Moonraker, mm -hmm. and the enemy character Jaws, the guy with the metal teeth, he's crashed in mm -hmm. the um, lift station of the cable car, and he's all covered in stuff. And the girl that helps him, like dust himself down, there's this iconic scene where she she smiles at him, and he goes, "Yeah, what were you what were you gonna say?" I was going to say, doesn't he smile back and then you can just see all his metal teeth? Is that right? Yeah. Originally, she smiles and she's got these braces on her teeth. That's right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 
And he smiles because, oh, I found somebody like me. I've got metal teeth, right? That was that yeah, was the yeah. whole thing. Now she hasn't got braces on her teeth. You can go, you, anyone listen, just Google it. She hasn't, right? The question is, did she ever? Did people get a false memory? Because years later there was an advert where a girl did have braces on her teeth and smiles at Jaws, right? And there was an advert about it. It was a credit credit yeah. card advert, I think, like at American right, Express right. or something, right? Um, is it that people have seen that and then automatically remembered the original wrong? Do you see what I'm saying? Yep, yeah. But, um, they all start merging, don't they? After 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 a long time, they all start merging together. Yeah, I remember false stuff wrong. Past. It's false. The past is all false. Yeah, I I I, I what I realised when I was writing my memoirs that things that I have thought could have sworn happened on a certain date, they didn't. They yeah. weren't even. Yeah. You know, I swore this yeah. guy said this to me because of this. And when I've checked yeah. the calendar, he can't have been saying that to me because it was six months before. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. I could have sworn. Right. Mm -hmm. Just, mm -hmm. just the way it, it is. Mm. Chris, to finish off. Yes, mate. What? Um, before and obviously you're, I'm going to ask you to promote anything that you, you 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 want before we go. But before I ask you to do that, what message are we giving to young people about the martial arts? What what? Um, yeah, um, my my message is probably not um, probably not ma mainstream. It's probably slightly off mainstream. I am a big fan of traditional martial arts. Um, I'm not I'm not a huge fan. And I know this is rather an unfashionable position. I'm not a huge fan of uh, fighting for the sake of fighting. I, I, I feel that um, martial arts is best for young people when the end goal is not beating somebody else up. I feel the, 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 the end result should be an improvement in your life uh, an improvement in the people in the lives of the people around you so I what I'm saying is I think that traditional martial arts can offer self-defense it can offer health and it should although it doesn't always include philosophical training as well uh, the martial arts historically has always been that the philosophy goes hand in hand with the fighting skills and I know, I know mate you know it's not lost on me that um, a lot of traditional schools aren't perhaps as good at fighting as modern schools. So we're talking about stuff like MMA schools and boxing. So I say, I say to people, do do that, you know, do do that for the physical aspect, but don't, you know, look down on and don't ignore the, the beautiful culture that martial arts, arts has to offer. Um, and it is life changing, mate. It, it really is. It's not just like, I know boxing can be, and I know MMA can be, but I mean, for, for me, like looking back, I was a kid on a council estate in, 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 in Birmingham. Uh, immigrant parents from a broken home, dyslexic, learning difficulties. And, you know, I, I've, I've done much better for myself than I would have had I not been involved in martial arts that ha in hand in hand taught me how to think as well as how to act. So, um, you know, I, I don't think it's all about fighting. I would love to say to people, you know, like, I won't bang on about, about this for a long time, Chris, but people often ask me like, oh, do you think I should do this martial art or that martial art? Well, isn't this much better and it's much quicker you can handle yourself? Well, yeah, but I, I think to myself, well, I wouldn't put my son in that. My eldest son is 14 now. He's been training with me for a long time, but I wouldn't want him to go into a ring and beat people up and be beaten up. Uh, for what? For what? I wouldn't put my son in there. So I don't want to put other kids in there as well. What I want to say is martial arts doesn't have to be, we got it wrong, it doesn't just have to be about fighting. There's so much more to it. Discipline, respect, you know, for yourself, for other people, for elders. Um, confidence. Uh, confidence, mate, you know, that's, that's a really good word, Chris. Confidence, like inner discipline and confidence and peace that you get from it. It might take a bit longer, but I think the benefits are more you know, so I, I say don't dismiss traditional martial arts because they've been going for thousands of years. And yes, it is quicker to learn something else. You can handle yourself in three months, but 
you can still you can still get that with the tradition as well um, but you get other stuff as well that's why it takes longer self-discipline self-respect you know like focus the ability to try and like overcome difficult things in your own life and because we all get knocks don't we sooner or later chris we're all going to get but life throws us curveballs doesn't it you know and uh just that ability to uh, pick yourself back up again i think is really important so and, and that's what i'm talking about what i'm promoting and what i'm doing at the moment is i'm teaching people online people can come train with me um uh, online in kung fu traditional kung fu or in tai chi um and we have a number of clubs now people going out and teaching and reaching communities and especially at this this time frame it's a really important thing to do and we i know we're changing a lot of lives chris it's really good really good i'm really happy with it what's what's the sort of cost if someone wants to come to you for lessons it's not expensive mate if they cut it's not expensive i keep the prices very available so my club where if they want to come and train with me and my club's quite small their cost is something like seven pound a lesson or something seven eight pound maybe not eight eight pound a lesson something like that and if they want to train in one of the franchise clubs, mate, it's a fiver. It's nothing, you know. Um, so that's how we operate. And yeah. And how does how does a person teach kung fu over the internet? Good question. It's almost it's really difficult to be honest with you. It took a, a, a lot of work. I spent probably six months working out the syllabus, just the syllabus. So we drill up and down. So we have like, like in a class. There may be not a lot, like in my class, maybe uh, 10 or 15 people, something like that, not a lot, uh, sometimes less, sometimes a little bit more. Um, and I teach them, right, break down the moves. So they break down the moves, they'll do the move, then I'll observe each one of them. And I give them a syllabus as well. I say, right, this month you've got to learn these and I'll teach them the techniques. I practice with them online twice a, twice a week or three times a week. They go away and practice it on their own and then I review it and I look at them. Every three months, we put them through a little test to make sure they've got that block of syllabus done. Uh, there's a drilling. Um, there's a lot of kind of like, so you, 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 like it's drilling, man. Like martial arts is drilling. You don't, it's good to have a, it's not, it's not good to dive in and start sparring with people, hitting people. That's one aspect of martial arts. But to drill first, you drill it so it's second nature. So you don't have to think because if you have to think, when, when you're in, in a conflict or a confrontation, you're one second behind the guy who's already started the launch the attack. It's a lose-lose. It's got to be drilled. So I, I still drill now, man. I've been doing it for, what, 35 years or something. I drill myself still. Not every day, but I, I, every week, a couple of times a week, I'll just drill up and down, up and down, up and down, doing a certain technique over and over and over again because it's the drilling, right, and then later the putting in practice that actually makes... The stuff will work if you haven't done it and it's not second nature it's got to be a reaction it's got to be like that my first teacher said back in the day when we didn't have computers he said it's like a typewriter you hit the return key on the typewriter and it goes choo -choo -choo. it comes back straight away so it's like so stimulus uh, result stimulus result it's not a thinking process um so yeah that's that's how we do it so we drill a lot online um and it's working really well my students are but believe it or not, dare, dare I say it, right? Because I used to just teach one weekend a month. They'd come to me for eight, because they were from all over the country, weren't they? So like you couldn't do it like three times a week when, before it was online. So they'd come down and we'd train for one weekend a month and then go away doing homework. But it'd be like eight hours a day, eight hours on a Saturday, eight hours on a Sunday. So it's quite intense. But then they go back up and some of them are in Scotland. So it's a long old way. You can't travel all the time. And um, dare I say it, like since we've gone online, I rejected it all my life. I was like, it's nonsense. It's terrible. You can't do this. It's not tradition. No, no, no. Since I did it, because my students, some of them were like struggling with, you know, the the recent events that have happened and that, and they're like emotionally, some of them were struggling, not being able to train, not being able to go out. So I, I made the change. I went online, started teaching them, and dare I say it, I think they I think they're better than I, I don't think they're they're better. They're getting better than they were when they were. And I think it's just that little and often, like it's little and often, yeah. three times a week it's an hour a class or whatever it is it's not it's not overly intense uh teaching is taken pace by pace uh, we break it down you know and just get it right you know and really spend the time getting it right do the same with the tai chi with the tai chi we just do like there's 24 moves in the system that we t I teach yang style tai chi 24 moves i do one move per month and we just just do it we just break it all down every little movement 
a single whip. Okay, well, this is like picking up a tissue, pick up a tissue, here, here, press, it's like pressing, simple, very, very simple. Um, and we meditate as well, every class, yeah. Tai Chi, is this like getting in touch with the universal energy that I'm always talking yeah. about? Yeah, mate, totally. Tai Chi is massive. I think it's I, I, it's brilliant. It's basically, Chris, what it is, you know, you've got meditation, right? You've got meditation, uh, which is seated position. And then the ancient people worked out that you can also meditate when they're doing the martial arts. You can also meditate during martial arts. And although Tai Chi is actually only like a couple of hundred years old, the form that we practice now, its origins are thousands of years old so the ancients worked out you can get in that state of mind by doing martial arts so they slowed it right down and they teach meditation in movement so the idea Chris I won't as I say I, I, I tend to waffle so I won't go on too much but the, there's like a four stage process that I teach we we teach first of all meditation seated right because we all know how to do that you get a grip of your mind right you start observing the, the, the mind when it's like thoughts about the future, like worries about the future. You say, oh, I'm in a thought, I'm thinking about the shopping or I'm thinking about I've got to do this or that bill or the other. You go, right, okay, I'm in a thought. Uh, right, bring it back to the center, to your breathing. So just breathe, breathe, breathe. And then your mind starts wandering off to the past. I wish I didn't do that, I'd have done that. I'm sad about this, like, and so you go, oh, I'm in a thought again. So you bring it back to the center, right? So that's seated meditation, like anchoring people in the present. And that helps you undermine the fears of the future and the sadnesses of the past. So you can start to direct your mind in a way, you can't control it because you can't, you can't control your mind, that's nonsense. You just direct it, right? So, so it starts to become still. Then you start to like have more understanding about yourself and insights into yourself and other people. But then the ancients worked out that you can also, another benefit is if you start, if you can hold that mindset once you've learned it in, in movement as well, well, then um, it has a more profound, a more even more profound effect. It's like rubbing your head and patting your belly. Once you get the hang of it, you get more control over your body. So you get more um, ability to direct your mind away from the things you don't want it to be thinking about and more like freedom in your mind. And finally, the, the big goal is to try and be, is to try and be still, mentally still in conflict or confrontation so that you 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 know yourself like if you if like conflict and confrontation for all of us adrenaline you know it's a scary fucking place just tunnel vision all that stuff um but if you can try and be more still and calm in confrontation then it has an even bigger benefit on your life and your ability to not get dragged into the circus of that confrontation and lose your mind and be controlled by the other party so the idea is seated meditation bring it into still movement and then bring it into uh combat you know it's 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 a, it's a gentle practice of the idea of combat and eventually you start to be able to train your mind to be more still uh in other areas of your life and i apologize if i've spoken too much there mate oh no this is the good stuff mate you just summed it up i mean for people who haven't been on the journey, by journey, I mean the journey of learning in life. Yeah, they're probably like, what the hell are these two old farts talking about, right? <laughs> but no, I mean, yes. just the simple fact, when you're fighting, and yeah. by fighting, I mean exercising, you know, competition yeah, yeah. with someone, yeah. you, like, do you want to be thinking about the shopping? Do you want to be thinking about, oh, yeah. I've got to pick the kids up? Do you want to be thinking about, God, I, you know, does my does my bum look big and yeah. you don't want that you want to be pure of mind focused in the moment with nothing coming into your mind That's other than this guy's going to be moving towards yeah. me his yeah. body's going to be trying to hurt me and i need to just yeah. you yeah. know work just i need to be free to deal with what's coming and not be clustered with all this other yeah i mean it's perfect you start sitting you you find your peace the thoughts are coming in you just let them go out you focus on that void that beautiful mm. moment of mm. connection with the universe where you are the universe the universe is you and nothing else matters and then you move it up into action where mm. you're still keeping that single focus now yep. your opponent's coming you 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 don't even i don't know if you even need to think about them per se although i guess it helps to know no, you don't that's where the drills come in 
So the drilling then takes Real. care of itself. Yeah, you, keep, yeah, you, yeah, you keep an open, you keep an empty mind. And the thing is that we often say, like, when you're fighting, you, you, if there's, if you've got one opponent in front of you, you ain't fight, fighting one opponent. You're fighting two because you've got your negative mind as well. Your mind's going, fucking hell, he's massive. He's going to batter me. Oh, I'm going to be embarrassed. Fuck, I'm going to look terrible when I get my nose broken. And he's going to kick the shit out of me. And you've got all that going on in your mind. So you've got to steal that stuff. And honestly, control doesn't fucking work. You can't control that stuff. But what you can do is over years of practice, you can learn to say, oh, that's just a thought. And you out of your mind and you're gone and you're back into the void, or back into the emptiness. And you're just observing purely and then reacting to the situation in a way that will give you a more positive outcome. That's likely to give you a more positive outcome. So, um, and in everything, mate, you'll know. You, you might get a, hot, a hater on the podcast. Some guy goes, your podcast, shit, I fucking hate it. You don't know what you're talking about. And you get a rea an emotional reaction. You're like, oh, well, you, you, with meditation and Tai Chi and all, all the rest of it that goes with it, you're able to look at it and you go, oh, that was an interesting impact. It's not real though. Yeah. Gone. That's, that's, the, that's the bigger goal because you'll have conflict in life. You'll have struggles. You'll have arguments. You'll have disagreements. You'll have, you know, all sorts of things. And it goes back to what I first said, that master that taught me in Hong Kong is the leaf. You're not being blown left and right by the leaf on your way down. You're just going in the direction that you're going in. There you go. There you go. <laughs> There's some synchronicity for you. Yes. <laughs> Chris, where can people watch your your series? Are they available at streaming or are they DVD? How? I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, I think you can probably get it for free on on, uh, on YouTube now. Uh, I think most of the stuff is probably out there. Uh, the first series was Mind, Body, Kick-Ass Moves. Second was Miracles. Then we did something called Crudelian Crime for the BBC. Uh, I went out to China and I directed a couple of shows out there as well, which are floating around somewhere. Uh, we did some Canadian stuff in Brazil and, uh, and in, um, in Africa as well for, for a channel over there, OLN. So it's floating around, mate. You know, you're floating around, yeah. Yeah, still floating around. I couldn't see anywhere if you've written a book or, or not. Yeah, yeah. I did, a, I did a, I think it was 2000, might have been eight. It was a long time ago now. Um, I wrote an encyclopedia for DK, which is part of Penguin. Yeah. Yeah. And I did, like I, I did deep deep research basically into about three hundred arts and codified them. Uh, it's a it's a lovely book, and you can get it from the library. You don't need to buy it. Um, most I'll, libraries have it now. I'll put a link below the podcast, folks, if you do want to buy it. And uh, I yeah I, yeah, be available on Amazon, I, I guess, or, or wherever. It's not. I, don't, I think you might have gone out of print now, but they're still floating around. Um, it's called The Way of the Warrior um and it's a i tell you i, I do i am quite proud of it because i think I've, what i've done is i've kind of simplified like you 300 different arts it's not confusing it's a coffee table book there's loads of beautiful photography in it it's like very visual it's like visual anthropology you know of the fighting arts from around the world it's a good it's a good it's a good book to look at and of course if people want to come and and, and join our club they can get in touch with me my email is chris uh, that's C-R-U-D-E-L-L-I.com. You can look at the website. That's my surname, crudeli.com. And uh, the franchises that I uh, am involved with are taichi24.club. So they can go on there. Um, and kungfu36.com um, with the numerical like 36 or the 24. And all the information's out there, man. It's, yeah, I'd say getting, it's, it's life-changing stuff. And I, I, we do what, what we do, we do well. Um, we do it friendly, we're supportive and, um, you know, we're there, we're there to serve, man. We're really there to serve, you know? So yeah, that's, that's, that's what we're about. All the links you mentioned, we'll put them in the description friends. So have a look if you want to get in touch with Chris and I strongly recommend you do. Um, I was playing, uh, I wasn't playing. I was, I did a video on call of duty yesterday cause I've been asked to do it for so long now and I've, been procrastinating and uh i can't help feeling yeah it's it's fun playing call of duty you know you get to shoot people without any consequences if that's fun i'm i i, I don't know what I'm, I'm i'm i'd be like water just be like water people fun is not fun is very great it doesn't really matter it's <laughs> 
all roads lead to Rome. But but I think what I would say is what I said to you before the podcast, Chris, is look when I look back at, on my deathbed, or, or probably already looking back now, it, it's I really wish I'd mastered a martial art, you know. Mm. I wish I'd mastered an instrument and I wish I'd mastered a a, a language better than I have. I've spoken lots of languages. I've played guitar and, and piano and I thoroughly enjoyed all of it. And, and I've, I've done a, my year of judo and um, one bout of boxing, which was enough. <laughs> and um, my kind of foray into my self-taught Kung Fu whilst I was in Hong Kong. And I've enjoyed all of that, but I can't help thinking, you know, maybe put the Xbox down a bit and actually go and do one of Chris's classes. And you, it's you not too late. We'd welcome that. you, mate. And you, 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 I say master, but you'd have the whole Tai Chi down in 24 months. There's 24 blocks, one block a month. It's a great community. They're really cool people. You'd like a lot of them. And um, yeah, just, just come, come along because it'd be really cool for, to, to, to try out a class and let us know what you think about yeah. it, you know? Is it just the Tai Chi you do, or do you do the martial arts over? I, I so I teach two things. I teach one class, like on a Monday and a Wednesday every week. Uh, I'm teaching Tai Chi, and I teach a separate class of Kung Fu as well. So I teach Kung Fu first. It's like six till seven o'clock, and Tai Chi is like seven till eight, roughly. And do you know what? We've got people from all over the world joining in as well. We've got people from Sweden, France, US. We've got people in New York and on the on the other coast as well in California. So it's a really good community of people who who are, you know, in, intelligent people who, who like martial arts and want to learn and advance themselves. So yeah, I'd, I'd welcome you to the class, um, mate. I really would. Yeah, I'd definitely be up for that. I'd like to do one of each if that's okay. Of course, man. And that's Just join us. Come on, come on Monday, Chris. Yeah. If you're not doing anything, come on Monday. Okay. If I'm if I'm free, it might might actually be in a, in, a, in a couple of weeks' time because I've just got a massive amount on at the minute, but. Um, I'll yeah, send you a link. I'm going to write. I'm going to write this down. Book a class. Because then I can. Um, I'll, I can talk about that in a video. My experience. Yeah. What, what do they get? Be awesome. Be awesome. Bruce Lee, right? When I was yeah. in that bodybuilding gym in Hong Kong, when Bruce Lee came on the telly, as it was, but we didn't have screens back then. We had televisions. Yeah. <laughs> Bruce Lee came on on the national news or, you know, some some item, yeah. about, item about him in the media. Everybody in the gym just put down their weights and stared at this iconic legend of a man on the screen. What, what can you tell us about Bruce Lee, mate? Oh, I'm a massive fan of Bruce Lee, like absolute legend, wasn't he? Um, he uh, he was a guy who um, I think like I think the two thing two massive things that he did were first of all like breaking into film right as an Asian man breaking into Hollywood in the seventies I mean it's how many Asian leads do you know now even now you know twenty twenty so he was a dynamo an absolute force of nature right so kung fu aside so what he did for Asian people. Uh, was 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 incredible, and I think I think the figures are still to this day. His um, his last film, The End of the End of the Dragon, is still like pound or dollar for dollar the highest grossing film in terms of what they've put in and what they've got out. So um, it shows martial arts can make uh, huge amounts of money in the box office if it's done well, and it shows that um, you know the leads. The lead actors in Western films don't always have to be the blonde hair, blue eyed, eye eyed boys. You you know you can. There is diversity will sell. You know if somebody's got charisma, they've got charisma. Doesn't matter what color they are. Um, so it, I think that was I think that was massive, right? And all of that came out of his martial arts, didn't it, Chris? He was um, he, like in terms of his martial arts, he was a guy who um, broke away with tradition, and he started taking the best bits of what he could find at the time and integrating them you could say he was the father of mixed martial arts it wouldn't be a leap to say that mate because he was incorporating bits of judo throwing techniques he's like well kung fu stand-up game from hong kong hasn't got any groundwork 
So let's take a bit of that. Let's take a bit of this. Um, I was just at his house last year. Um, and, and that was like massive for me. So I, my, my wife is American and we went over to, um, to see her family. She's actually down in the South, but we were over in California and we, we landed in San Francisco. Uh, so we went and did all that thing. And then when we left, we had about a day left in San Francisco. So we went up to his old house in Oakland, the place where he first started teaching martial arts in America. Incredible, mate. It was one of his mate's houses. And here's the thing, he'd already done a few films by this stage. Now, Oakland, it's expensive now, but it's not, it's a, it's a slightly downtrodden neighborhood in many ways. Um, it's out of town, you know, it's like probably about half an hour out of town. So it's in the suburbs. And he, it looked to me from looking at the structure of the house, like he was actually renting the top part of the house. Cause you can see like a separate sideway uh, entrance up and that's been there for a long time. If you look at the old photos as well. So, he was so dedicated to his art, right? He's top of his game in terms of his martial arts, top of his game in terms of he'd made films. He'd already made films at that stage. And yet he was renting a roof section of his mate's house in a suburb um, of, of outside of San Francisco. So he'd compromised an awful lot to keep focusing on his art and his film work. Because um, you know, as yourself, like when you're a dad, you want to, do the, you want to settle down a bit you want to do the best you can for your family and if you're still running around chasing a dream it's kind of quite hard so um on, on all of all of his family it would have been really hard um so yeah it was just inspiring to see that house and to actually and i took some of the i looked at some of the old photos you can find them on google of him standing outside the house and in oakland california and you're just like that's it wow they haven't painted that wall well they changed the garage door but you can you can work out you know you can see this stuff in a young bruce lee um in the first place that he taught so yeah just um i'm, I'm a huge huge fan I met some of his students you know Chris. Really? i met some of his students yeah yeah so i uh, i got an award a couple of years ago and, and richard bastillo was there um handing out awards he was one of bruce lee's students he, he was just before he died actually and um in, incredible man and he had some wonderful stories and still you know he, i don't know how old he was he must have been in his 80s chris he was still doing martial arts and um, still have really fond, warm memories of, of that time of, that he trained with Bruce Lee. Mm. Yes, I guess um, his impact was in the States, wasn't it? I mean, in, initially, which then spread globally. Yeah. And I suppose up until then, the perception that people in the USA had of Asians or, or Chinese or Hong Kong Chinese yeah. in particular was in a very certain way, wasn't it? They would have been, I mean, Hollywood has always portrayed them as like coolies, you know, the, the working on the railways and which, which they, they obviously did in history. Then you had the kind of the Charlie Chan, the kind of wise wizened old detective kind of image. Um, women were always a bit dark and mysterious and sultry if that if, i don't know if that's the right word and then and then of course from a business perspective very ruthless in business or very focused rather very you know the family restaurant that everyone's in employed everyone's involved it, it, it's this kind of thing we've got a guest sorry chris this is my wife can say hello so kind of that, isn't that? Oh, she bought me a cup of coffee, Chris, because it's so kind. Uh, of oh, hello. <laughs> hello. Hi. How are you? Um, doing great. How are you doing? Yes, absolutely super. Having a an amazing chat with your husband. It's been thoroughly enjoyable. Oh, in there. That but map? It's like hours. There. Uh, yeah, that map. Your map on the back of your hat. We've got one of those. That looks incredible. Your background is really incredible, Chris. Yeah, this is a really nice map. It's it's canvas, and yep, it's got yep. it, it's one that rolls up. It's got the like a yeah. wooden, if you can see it. Oh like, yeah, wooden base, right? Yeah, yeah. Wooden bar, oh, that's cool. So keep, that's awesome. awesome. And it's. I'll get you it. Thanks, yes. Nice to see you. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Tom. So um, yeah. So, well, yeah, what was I saying? So they had this kind of stereotypical perception of, um, I think they call it Orientalism when you, 
when you stereotype people from the east in a certain yeah. um, Hollywood textbook, you know, often a villain type capacity. And then, of yeah. course, Bruce Lee came along and he's this young, cool dude who's mm -hmm. very, very handsome, you know, yep. particularly handsome for, for in, 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 in the way it transferred from being Chinese into yep. America. He's got this ripped body that just looks like he could, you know, it's, it's yeah, toned, like a race toned, horse, toned, it? toned to perfection. Yeah. Um, everything that came out his mouth was just so simple and yet so wise. Yeah, and of course, badass, he's a bloody ninja at the old kung fu. Yeah. Uh, he 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 must have changed. I mean, he made. I mean, he made being Chinese cool, didn't he? He did, mate. He totally did in a time period where. You know the powers that be were not that way inclined um in fact i'll tell you a story you know even recently um my wife's cousin um bought a property in in uh, in new mexico in albuquerque in america and i think there was something on the land contract that said no chinese aren't allowed to buy it it's obviously an antiquated law but they hadn't they hadn't got up to date to getting rid of it it was still on the contract and you're thinking like what how can this be possible so like yeah in in the psyche of of the western people it wasn't cool to be chinese and bruce made it very cool and he was very chinese wasn't he you know he he spouted off the philosophy he did the kung fu he was a badass he took no prisoners um for a lot of kids around that time he, he's not i mean he is an icon but but he was also he was like a guy who said, you know, you don't have to live in the normal way, man. There's another way to be. You know, you can get involved in this cool philosophy, get involved in these cool arts. You could be a man, you know, um, and uh, yeah, resonated, I think. And it still does now, like 50 years after his death, you know. Uh, wonderful, yes. Wonderful human being. There's so much mystery surrounding, isn't it? There's been some, I don't know how true they are. But there's been some really good documentaries that have been out. Some yep. oh. had these kind of things like the last 24 hours of so and so's life. I think they did one of those on Bruce Lee. And oh, um, right, right. there was a lot going on behind the scenes, wasn't there, that we we didn't, as the public, didn't really understand. So there was, I don't know if I'm tarnishing his his what's the word his um legacy but reputation you know i think there was a bit of infidelity going on there i think there was alleged 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 a bit of wacky backy chucked in the mix which um i think yeah. he started smoking when he he had disc problems didn't he? he had very severe spinal problems yeah he put his spine out as a uh, disc problems as a lot of people have uh in the martial arts um and i think it was popular as well at the time wasn't it the wacky backy and all the rest of it i think i think i don't know if i'm wrong here but i think they found that in the toxicology report I'm didn't not, they? That, that from someone of my background it's not a judgment call yeah. whatsoever what i meant no, of course, of course. what i meant is it was a bit shocking for people that held him as this absolute idol that this guy's perfect to subsequently learn no we're, we're all human unfortunately and uh, well fortunately yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's good and it, for me, it becomes interesting going back to our conversation about what is art is mm. you then start to see, ah, ah, he had a stunt man for doing that backflip stunt because he'd broken his back, right? You know, he had a busted back. I get it now. And then your mind starts to think, I wonder how much of the film work was, you know, it was essentially stunt work. It, it, you know, he's yeah, not it's all choreographed. Yeah. All the fight scenes, they wouldn't stand up in real life. They were just, it's just, uh, you know, dramatic stuff for TV. And I don't, I, he wouldn't have fought that way either in real life. You know, he's, he's fighting art that he developed. Jeet Kune Do is very, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not filmic. It's very direct. It's called the way of the intercepting fist for a reason. It's very direct. It's very quick. It's based on essentially like his Hong Kong Wing Chun style uh, at the time, which was very close quarter fighting. And uh, he added in bits and bobs from other, other stuff as well. It wasn't dramatic. It wasn't. You know, it didn't flail around and look wonderful. It, it was just about stopping people in their tracks, you know. Yes. 
Sorry, I'm just my my focus wandered there, mate, because we've got someone trying to get into our waiting room. And I tell you what, if you turn up in our Zoom call without an invite, you well, Bruce Lee, yeah. the way of the intercepting Fisk, Max, whoever you are, Max. <laughs> yeah, be gone, be gone. This is the trouble when you use the same Zoom number for 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 different Multiple. meetings. Yes. Yeah. Um, or, or I better just actually check that I haven't booked book someone in and completely forgotten about it wouldn't be the uh oh right okay no we're not there yet so it's my next meeting has come an hour early and that's because they're they're um they're europeans i'm just gonna well, i'm gonna ask you a question then i've got to just tell this guy stop trying to get in our meeting where you're an hour early <laughs> i forgot i forgot they're in europe it's my it's my documentary team where we're making a documentary at the moment or we're at least putting the plans together um so yes so you had all of this kind of intrigue around his life what about the um you know without compromising yourself chris um because i know you're a man that obviously knows lots of people in different places but what about this route there was a rumor he'd upset the triads which was by teaching the west you know the secret art of kung fu was was there any truth in that um i think it's one of those things again like where there's some truth in it that's got mixed up historically over the sort of course of our you know our group memory if you like there's a couple of things going on there's questions as to whether he was involved in um in, in in any triad activity as a youth before he left Hong Kong. And that some people rumor that, um, in fact, his dad sent him to go study in America because he was getting into a lot of trouble. Uh, he was an energetic lad, you know, and he loved Kung Fu and he was out there and he wasn't afraid to tell people if he thought they were wrong, um, which is one of the amazing qualities about his, you know, his, co his courage really as a human being, uh, in a, you know. Um, so I suppose there's, there's, that, there's that question um, and then I suppose the other thing that we're talking about is when he started teaching Westerners out in San Francisco, um, what exactly happened around the, um, the, the Chinatown people? I don't know whether they were or weren't uh, members of organised crime, I'm not sure. It wouldn't surprise me if they were. Um, they tend to look after each other and band together, in, uh, especially in overseas cities and chinatowns um they're called the, know, tong, as, the tongs in america aren't they yeah as a, as a lot of communities have the italians have done exactly the same as well you know they brought some of their cultures and some of their like um associations originally uh to when they've emigrated to different cities as well so there's the question of first of all were they or weren't they oh, that's that's still open-ended question i think but there was certainly um he experienced a lot of um pressure from from Chinese groups and martial arts masters at the time who didn't want to share the arts with Westerners. Um, and um, I, I think, like, again, historically, there's, there's probably reasons for that. Um, and he just flew in the face and he said, no, nah, no, nah, mate, I'm doing what I want. This is what I believe in. Uh, there's no difference between any people, it doesn't matter if they're white, black, Asian, whatever. They're all people and I'm not going to view them any in any other way. You've got to remember, though, one thing. I think Bruce had some, I think it was maybe his grandfather or something was maybe German or his grandmother or something. He had some he had some European blood. Um, and I suppose that may have influenced him as well to be more open minded. But he was just like, look, I'm a martial arts master. I'm going to do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, that resulted in him having some fights, um, which isn't particularly uncommon in martial arts circles um, to have people, they're martial artists, they like, they fight, that's what they do, you know. Um, and sometimes things are sorted out that way if they can't be sorted out other ways. So he had, he had that to, to, to deal with, didn't he? Uh, in the, early, what was it, late 60s, early 70s or whatever it was. Is there any um, truth, Chris, in, the, um, in the, the story that when they were filming, I think, was it Enter the Dragon was in that big famous house in Hong Kong? With the big grounds, like I think they probably would have been tennis court grounds, but they co-opted yeah. the, co-opted them into the film as the training ground on this secret island or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. 
And I heard a rumor that, or I saw it in a documentary that because all the extras in the Hollywood film industry have traditionally been um, triads, uh, the triads yeah. traditionally running the movie industry in Hong Kong, which isn't a secret anybody, <laughs> um, yeah. that, that a lot of the extras in that Enter the Dragon were gangsters, basically, you know, in, in the Brotherhood. And every time they had a break, one of them would want to, like, try his luck with Bruce Lee just to say, you know, I can have you, right? And so he, Bruce Lee would just say, okay, come on. <laughs> Let's see what you got. <laughs> so I've been I doing so. impressions. Yeah, I can really, see that. You've been working on the accents, yeah. I've really been I'm enjoying... impression as well. Yeah, I've really been enjoying doing impression. I don't know why. Um, I, I think so, mate. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard those things as well. Um, but he was challenged on the set a couple of times and just, just kicked ass. I mean, you know, that's what he did best, wasn't it, really? He was incredibly fast. He was fucking lightning fast. Well, you uh, have to be. If you're, if you're that small and light, it's like you say, you've got to hit yeah. up with, with the fist. I mean, you're not going to grapple yeah. someone to the ground. Yep. You're, you're not going to... Um, no, you're right, mate. You've got to get in, in and out very quick, and that's what he was brilliant at doing. Mm. Just getting in, being very accurate, like precision strikes, uh, soft targets, boom, in and out, gone. So yeah, I think I think um, I think he, I think yeah. I mean, people give you a lip, don't they? And you know, you're dealing with rough, rough people. It happens. I don't think any hard feelings were were out. Probably he's probably quite gracious about it. Just give him a couple of licks and then, you know, picked them back up, shook their hand, and dusted them off and mm. back to work. You know. And there was um, one documentary you watched. It explained his death really well because there were lots of rumours around that um i can't i'll be honest i can't remember what the summary was but it was an aneurysm basically he had a brain aneurysm yeah uh, for an allergic reaction they think to uh analgesic analgesic so like an aspirin or paracetamol we call it that in england yeah so he, he, had, he had a reaction to it and he had a brain bleed and that's what you were talking about um was because he was found in another woman's bed um uh, she was uh, she was an actress that he was that he was working with, and she was he was over there. They say working on some script ideas. He had a headache. She gave him some pills. He went to lie down in a bed. That's why he was found in a bed. Um, you know, that's you know. And she didn't. That's what happened. He was hesitant to call the to call a doctor. I think because she knew he'd been smoking or something. And and of course, by the time the doctor did arrive on scene, there was some hesitant issue. Yeah, I think she called the producer first, didn't she? Was it That's Raymond Chow, yeah. um, who was, I think, head of Golden um, Harvest Studios? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think with yeah, a lot which of is these, a bit of an unusual thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. If, well, it, it, it it's just that substance use was so taboo back then. I mean, it's taboo now, but um, and then yeah, right. Um, right. You know, it's it's how many people have watched their friend die rather than just call a bloody ambulance, right? Because they're afraid of you know, some retribution, consequences, some repercussions. Where in actual fact, the ambulance crew you just want to know what's the pers- what's wrong with a person so they yeah. can save their life. Um, yeah, but it's a bit like the Michael Jackson situation, wasn't it? And also um, Diego Maradona, two people in there. Mm-hmm. who were still under so much pressure to perform and still sought the adoration of the crowd and um, both of whom mm-hmm. both of whom actually took amphetamines to try to get their careers back on the go so michael jackson was taking amphetamine to, to, to try to perform his dance routine as he had as a 21 year old but now he's 40 diego maradona yeah. was the same he when he was banned from the world cup he tested positive for um, some form of amphetamine, um, and it's it's sad, isn't it? Because something that you understand, you know, why these guys wanted to be up there. They, you know, they, they a bit like Paul Gascoigne, isn't it? You know, they have this massive glory year or two, then they get beset by an injury or something, and through no fault of their own they have to take this step back and they have some 
down years and then they get the chance to get back on a horse again and of course you know it's really tempting to want to you know put the odds in your yeah. favor right uh, yeah i completely un you know sort yeah. of understand this thing and but i heard this, a little bit similar thing with bruce that that you know his body was failing him i think because he was in his 30s when he died was it was he 40 yet yeah i think he was i think he was 32 34 32 something like that yeah, he was young was very very young but he'd over he'd over trained as well hadn't he yeah that's he'd done he's so intense man and it's like people say well the more training you do the better and you, as a younger man you know you know yourself you're like you agree with that you think oh yeah just go all day eight hours nine hours doesn't matter whatever you've got to do um but you can't run a racehorse like that the racehorse will die uh, or it will, you know, it will start malfunctioning. So I, I think, I do think that it probably, I, I think I personally think that his, his, his death was potentially caused by actually overtrained, by training too much, man. He'd plug himself into the wall, wouldn't he? Did you know? No, I didn't He'd plug know himself that. into electricity for dynamic tension. So your whole body tenses up. So your whole body goes really rigid. Like It's like doing weight training, but on acid, it's like, you know, it's... Um, so I think he was a human being, he was a human dynamo. He had so much uh, power, personal like energy that he had to find an outlet. And um, he did incredible things in his short life. Had he lived longer, God only knows what, he, what we would have seen from, from him. A creative, an intellectual, a philosopher, a writer, a fighter. You know, he had it, he had it all going on. Film star, movie star, you know. His family were up, his legacy was upset and hence his family recently weren't they after that that american movie that came out um i've seen it yeah, i can't I was it once yeah. upon a time in hollywood quentin mm. quentin tarantino uh, right okay that one yeah right okay and, i can understand that and the characters in it were all kind of caricatures of of hollywood yeah. legends or stars so you had your I don't know, was it Brad Pitt was in it playing some, like, I don't even know, let's just say Robert Redford type character or whatever. Probably got yep, that completely that's right. And then Bruce was there and the guy that played him was just a little bit left of centre, you know, he was a bit kind yeah. of, a bit zany. Hi, I'm yep. Bruce Lee. I yeah. you know, be like water, right? And it was just a, it, it was just what it was cheesy. Yeah, it was cheesy. Yeah, it was cheesy and it was just take the piss out of him. Um, and then Brad Pitt got to beat up Bruce Lee. Um, I just, I don't personally see the bad. I, I don't understand why you'd want, why that's funny or why you'd want to put that in the film. I'm a Bruce Lee fan, obviously I'm biased, but also I'm just like, well, really? Would you do it to Mike Tyson 30 years later? Put Mike Tyson in the film, like accentuate his lisp and then have a, a category Hollywood star beat him up to look hard. Mm, yeah sure. it's um i don't know I, i'm probably the sort of person on a different day i'd wake up with a different viewpoint on you it's that thing isn't it yeah that, that i don't try to be upset for this you know sure, but sure when people say you choose to be offended it's kind of like i don't know if i agree with that you know i, mm. I some things are just very wrong you know some things are very wrong and a lot of people in society just don't realize how wrong it is. The, some of the language we use about people that struggle, it's just awful, yeah. you know, mm. it's just awful. And it's, it, it goes back to the culture we're indoctrinated into to think that certain people are above other people. And it, and it happens a lot with disability or, or, you know, mental health and, you know, you're yeah. seen as a lower class of person and the language, uh, you know, the language, rep, it doesn't just rep, present this in it with some people but it you know what you say can keep people oppressed it can keep people pinned in it's why we don't use the n-word anymore it's like we're civilized enough now to realize actually that word kind of like oppressed the rights of black yeah, people right. for, for for hundreds you know hun hundreds of years or um yeah. or at least a couple of hundred hun hundred years and it's inappropriate you know um so the whole thing about you choose to be offended is 
you, well maybe you do but it's still something's some things are not right so i don't know i guess as an artist it's that it, it, it's that should there be like censorship when is censorship just blatantly bloody disrespectful i mean quentin tarantino uses the m-word in all his, all his films about 50 million times doesn't he um yeah. and he would argue that's his right as a thing i i would say it's dude it's still horrible for a big part of our community to hear that bloody word that was used about them in slavery yeah, but nah. You can come up with arguments, can't you, either way? And he, I'm sure he can as well. Yeah. But for the Bruce Lee thing, I thought it was a bit unnecessary. I, I like most of his films. I think some of them go on a little bit long. Uh, some of them are a bit self-indulgent. But um, generally, he's a brilliant filmmaker, he's a brilliant script writer. He's an amazing, um, he's an amazing artist. And you look at some of his early work, Pulp Fiction, I just, just showed my lap for that film the other day. And he, it's like, it's, what, 30 years old and it still doesn't miss a beat. It's an incredible uh film you know he's he's but yeah i mean there, there is that other thing as well of being so artistic that you just end up right up your own ass you know and you get lost in it all um and that's the reality of it doesn't matter how big you are you know you might be the biggest filmmaker in the world you can still get lost up your own ass um <laughs> it can happen you know and we don't have to just respect somebody just because of their status do we just because he's right up there we don't have to go oh he's fucking amazing well he is but ugh, some of the things yeah, you know. Have you have you found in your career, um, you've had to get on top of your ego? Yeah, massively, absolutely, mate. Um, yeah, just wrestle with it all the time because the thing the thing is, people who I mean, you know, people like 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 us in in a way, people who have a performance background or an artistic background. You want to show people your stuff, don't you? That's what you want to do. Ultimately, and people said to me when I first started working at the BBC, they were like, oh, you know, oh, you know, you presenters, you all, or you're actors, you all want to do this, and you're all just trying to get adulation. I was like, fuck off. No, I'm not. I'm just doing it because I like it. But I think, actually, there's an element of truth in it somewhere down the line. You do want to, like, uh, you do want to perform a, a job that you're good at, and you want people to say, oh, that's that's good. Like, I think somewhere, as much as I hate to admit it, I think there is something inside me and probably all performers that says, you want to do a good job, something you're good at, something you're happy with, and you want people to pat you on the back and say, well done. You know, even though you kind of, like, I kind of rejected it and I didn't, I didn't go out with a hat when the show first came out. I couldn't, for years, it didn't, I got really uncomfortable. But um, I think there is something about that. I think we do want to, there is something that we need to wrestle with our ego and we need to come to terms with it and we need to, you know, as crap as it sounds, we need to love ourselves a little bit more and find our own centre um, a bit more. And like an exercise I do with my students, Chris, I tell them, stand on one leg, right? They're all, they're balanced, yeah, they're balanced. And I say, right now, close your eyes. They close their eyes all over the shop. I say, why is that? Why, why can't you do that? And they say, well, I can't see. And I'm like, right, so you're orientating your balance based not on what you feel, but what on, on the exterior world. You're basing your balance on what you see. And that ain't right. We should base our centre and our balance on what we feel, not what we see and orientate ourselves to the external world. Because as soon as you do that, man, it's going to throw you left, right and centre. You're never going to, you, you can never, you can never please it. It's a big black hole, isn't it? Yes. I think knowing what we know now, and you look back at like the history of Hollywood and stuff and, and you know, they, he was difficult to work with. And now we understand why, don't we? It's because it's a yeah, lot of very yeah. damaged people come into yeah. the artistic industry to to get the adulation to and to express themselves like this is me. I can, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, some of the some of the world's most talented people, bless them, have been the most damaged. And of course, right. when you get that adulation, you've got to got to keep it down a bit. <laughs> You know, yeah. especially in this day of social media, because the next thing you know, you're putting a bloody Instagram video out, ranting and raving, and you know, da -da, and it's like, oh god, that's your ego yeah. talking. <laughs> yeah. So massive. Just uh, in uh, homage to Bruce Lee, there are. I'm going to put this out as a little clip, and um, as I think his 
his wife said at the end of one of the great uh, documentaries that was made about him, she said, I don't like to remember how Bruce died. I prefer to remember how he lived. Okay. Chris, what can I say? I thoroughly enjoyed this chat. Um, apologies, folks, if I've talked to, you know, a bit more than usual, but this is why I started the podcast, because I wanted to share experiences awesome, with people like Chris. It's just wonderful. Yeah, thank you, mate. You know, get to action. Thank you so much for having me. Big fan. Great show. And uh, and it is what it says on the tin, you know, it's two blokes having a chat in a, in a virtual pub, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. what I tell people. That's what I tell yeah. people. So, um... Yes, once again, on behalf of Bought the T-Shirt, thank you ever so much, Chris. It's been brilliant. Absolutely. And awesome. thank you. Stay on the line, mate. To our friends at home, if you could please like and subscribe and click the little bell thing. Friends, a lot of people are missing podcasts and going, oh, why did I miss that one? And it's like, if you don't click the bell, you won't get a notification. So please do. Massive thank you all for your continued support. Things are really firing off now and uh, that's because of you guys so much love to you all be like water 